Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Gabriella Marino from the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences in the Vatican. And we're going to open the symposium officially uh, very shortly. So I'm here with some housekeeping information. What started off seven years ago at the request of Pope Francis as a small gathering of young activists involved in the fight against human trafficking around the world has turned into one of our most favorite events of the year. And this has led to so many new projects and lasting friendships. So let's hope we can meet in person at next year's edition. And meanwhile, I'd like to remind you of the following. So we do have Spanish, English, Spanish, simultaneous interpretation. Look for the globe on your screen. Tenemos traducción simultánea inglés español. Si buscan el globo en la pantalla, ahí hay, tienen las opciones. Please use a headset with a microphone if possible, if you are a speaker, because it makes it easier for the interpreters to hear you. The event is live on YouTube on SDSN's channel. So make sure you share it with your friends and colleagues. Please keep your microphones off unless the moderator unmutes you. Keep your cameras on if possible, because we would love to see you. Do use Zoom reactions, uh, heart, thumbs up or down. And it's always, um, it makes it more cheerful. Uh, pose your questions via the chat box to specific panelists. Uh, when posing questions, please state your city and country. Feel free to post any ideas, comments, not just questions. Uh, because this is how uh, new ideas can be fostered here at the Vatican Youth Symposium. And uh, use the hashtag um, VYS2020 and Mission 4.7 and tweet or post at speakers and their respective organizations. And uh, that's it from me. I'd like to hand over to Sam Loney now, the founder of SDSN Youth and uh, a longtime friend already. We're always uh, so happy to work with you, Sam. So thank you for uh, joining us this year again. Um, okay, if you have any questions, feel free to message me directly. Thank, thank you, you very much, Gabriella. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Okay, great. Uh, as Gabriella said, my name is uh, Sam Loney and I'm a program director with the SDSN. I'm, I'm also the founder and director of Global Schools at, at the SDSN. Uh, I've had the privilege of chairing this symposium for the past uh, five years, uh, of course, with the patronship of Monsignor Sanchez and Professor Sachs, two wonderful uh, mentors and, and, and patrons. Uh, seven years ago, Pope Francis inspired this symposium through his commitment and his call for La Data Si, human rights and sustainable development and dignity. It has since become an intergenerational space dedicated to important conversations between uh, leaders and organizations of different movements around the world for sustainable development. Uh, over the years, some incredible initiatives have emerged from this symposium. I think there are too many to name here, uh, but certainly for more, please look at the website. And of course, as always, thank you to our wonderful partners at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences uh, for your uh, partnership, leadership and support over the past uh, few years, in particular, Gabriela Monsignor. Uh, usually we would have this meeting uh, in the... Uh, we would have this meeting in the Pontifical Academy, uh, in, in the beautiful halls of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, but uh, not today because of the uh, global circumstances. Uh, but we hope nevertheless, it will be an exciting meeting. In any case, we have a very exciting program ahead with lots of wonderful speakers, uh, with two important events. Uh, on day one, we will have the launch of Mission 4.7, which will be happening shortly. And on second day, we will be uh, talking about human rights and of course the uh, launch of the Youth Solutions Report uh, in session six. Uh, so today is dedicated to the launching of Mission 4.7. And let me just say, uh, two years ago when Professor Sachs and I were discussing this idea, I would have never imagined uh, this grand launch and the wonderful partnerships that have emerged to make this happen. And this all thanks to the leadership of Professor Sachs in pushing this initiative forward. 
Um, and it is all based on this critical and important principle that we have a moral duty to educate and prepare children for a world that's going to be more complex, challenging and unpredictable and enable them to shape sustainable, prosperous and resilient communities for the future. We at Global Schools are a proud partner and we're very excited to work with everyone else. And with that, I hand over to Monsignor Sanchez to begin the session and, in, and introduce the video from Pope Francis. Monsignor. Hello, hello. I am very happy to see all of you here in this very important gathering in the context of Christmas, that is for, uh, for us, the birth of Christ is the birth of love and uh, the birth of peace and we need to renew our our love to ourselves in the good and uh, to the others and uh, really we need to go again to hate again to war again to violence again to to the things that are not truth that are not just and especially this in education, because education is the more important mission that we can have. I say, <laughs> sorry, but we can quote it. Aristotle, la politique, say the more important function that have the people is to have education to the new generations. And this education begin with ourselves, begin if we put in at the center the love and the peace and and the love and the peace for ourselves in the good but also for the other people so in the context of christmas we need that we need to renew this with the consciousness with the absolutely uh, uh, conviction that uh, this love comes from god and uh, and god is just love and love uh, our our people, we can believe one thing, other thing, but in the end, the essence of this is love. For this we that are image of God, we need to renew this love, especially in this moment, and especially in a, in the context of education. Thank you very much. Well, I think that we have the message of the Pope. Señoras, señores, la educación es siempre un acto de esperanza que desde el presente mira al futuro. No existe la educación estática. La reunión de hoy en la Casina Pío IV es un acto de esperanza y solidaridad generacional, de esperanza y solidaridad intergeneracional. Los jóvenes líderes y los educadores globales se están reuniendo desde todas partes del mundo para promover un nuevo tipo de educación que permita superar la actual globalización de la indiferencia y la cultura del descarte. Dos grandes males de nuestra cultura, la indiferencia y el descarte. Este ha sido un año extraordinario de sufrimiento por la pandemia de COVID-19, un año de aislamiento obligado y exclusión, un año de angustia y crisis espirituales, y de no pocas muertes, y de una crisis educativa sin precedentes. Más de mil millones de niños han enfrentado interrupciones en su educación. Cientos de millones de niños se han quedado atrás en las oportunidades de desarrollo social y cognitivo. Y en muchos lugares, las crisis biológicas, psíquicas, económicas, han empeorado mucho por las crisis políticas y sociales que tienen aparejadas. Ustedes se han reunido hoy en un acto de esperanza. Un acto de esperanza para que los impulsos de odio, divisiones e ignorancia puedan y sean superados a través de una nueva buena onda, digamos así, una nueva buena onda de oportunidades educativas basadas en la justicia social y en el amor mutuo. Un nuevo pacto global para la educación, lanzado ya en octubre con algunos de los presentes. 
Ante todo les agradezco por reunirse hoy para hacer crecer nuestras esperanzas y planes compartidos en una nueva educación que fomente la trascendencia de la persona humana, el desarrollo humano integral y sostenible, el diálogo intercultural y religioso, la salvaguarda del planeta, los encuentros por la paz y la apertura a Dios. Las Naciones Unidas ofrecen una oportunidad única para que los gobiernos y la sociedad civil del mundo se unan tanto en la esperanza como en la acción por una nueva educación. Cito con gusto el mensaje de reconocimiento de San Pablo VI a las Naciones Unidas. Dice así, vosotros habéis cumplido, señores, y estáis cumpliendo una gran obra, enseñar a los hombres la paz. Las Naciones Unidas son la gran escuela donde se recibe esta educación. La Constitución de la UNESCO, adoptada en 1945, al final de la tragedia de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, reconoció que, puesto que las guerras nacen en la mente de los hombres, es en la mente de los hombres donde deben erigirse los baluartes de la paz. Hace 75 años que los fundadores de la UNESCO pidieron asegurar a todos el pleno e igual acceso a la educación, la posibilidad de investigar libremente la verdad objetiva y el libre intercambio de ideas y conocimiento, a fin de que los pueblos se comprendan mejor entre sí y adquieran un conocimiento más preciso y verdadero de sus respectivas vidas. En nuestro tiempo en que el Pacto Educativo Mundial se ha quebrado, veo con satisfacción que los gobiernos se han comprometido nuevamente a poner en práctica estas ideas mediante la adopción de la Agenda 2030 y de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de las Naciones Unidas, en sinergia con el Pacto Global sobre la Educación. En el corazón de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible está el reconocimiento de que la educación de calidad para todos es una base necesaria para proteger nuestro hogar común y fomentar la fraternidad humana. Tal como el Pacto Global para la Educación, así también fundamentalmente el ODS-4 compromete a todos los gobiernos a garantizar una educación inclusiva, equitativa y de calidad, como asimismo promover oportunidades de aprendizaje durante toda la vida, y esto para todos. El Pacto Global para la Educación y la Misión 4.7 trabajarán juntos por la civilización del amor, la belleza y la unidad. Permítanme decirles que espero que ustedes sean poetas de una nueva belleza humana, una nueva belleza fraterna y amigable, como de la salvaguardia de la tierra que pisamos. No se olviden de los ancianos y de los abuelos, portadores de los valores humanos más decisivos. Gracias por lo que hacen. Y por favor, no se olviden de rezar por mí. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monsignor. And uh, we thank His Holiness Pope Francis uh, as the founder of this incredible uh, symposium and supporter of uh, Mission 4.7 and also for his inspiring message of support. Uh, and with that, we would like to kick off the session officially. And I am going to introduce the host of the session, Professor Jeff Sachs, who really needs no introduction, but uh, just a quick overview. Professor Sachs is the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, where he directed the Earth Institute from 2000 until 2016. He's also the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and he has served as an advisor to three United Nations Secretaries General, and currently serves as an SDG advocate under the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Professor Sachs was named twice as uh, Time Magazine's uh, 100 Most Influential World Leaders and has been ranked by the economists am amongst the top three most influential living economists. He's the co-chair of Mission 4.7. And for that, I give him the floor. Sam, thank you very much. And uh, 
welcome to all of the youth and all gratitude uh, and uh, Merry Christmas uh, to uh, Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, our host, and to Gabriela Moreno, our uh, dear, dear friend who helps us uh, each year for this wonderful occasion. And what a thrill to uh, uh, have uh, the start with uh, Pope Francis's words and his wisdom and his inspiration. He is guiding us uh, more than any other person uh, on the planet to uh, the kind of justice and future that we want. Uh, we should recall that Pope Francis uh, gave the uh, speech to uh, the world leaders on the occasion of adopting the Sustainable Development Goals on the morning of September 25th, 2015, in that wonderful occasion when he told the world leaders that our interdependence obliges us to think of one plan for our common home. And here we are today. Uh, oops. Are we uh, okay? Oh, fine. Uh, and here we are today to uh, help move forward on that common plan for our common home. Uh, Pope Francis has issued two encyclicals that in a wondrous way uh, help to guide our mission 4.7. Uh, indeed, they are uh, almost the, the manuscript of the mission 4.7. Laudato Si, of course, uh, issued uh, in 2015 uh, is a magnificent call to stewardship of the planet and protection of the creation, and especially uh, the need to uh, take actions to stop the devastation of human-made climate change. And now governments around the world are finally stepping forward. Uh, late, uh, but we hope not too late, to make commitments to decarbonize energy systems and to stop the human-made climate change. This past year, uh, Pope Francis issued another wondrous encyclical, uh, Fratelli Tutti, which calls on us to extend our fraternity to the whole world to have new encounters across cultures, uh, across peoples, to find new methods of dialogue and of education so that we can understand each other and therefore also understand ourselves to be able to help to create the kind of peaceful world that Marcelo spoke about uh, just moments ago. So with Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti, we have the calls for awareness and leadership in sustainable development and in uh, the global appreciation of culture and global citizenship. And how wonderful that uh, that guidance is so uh, utterly compatible with our purpose of launching Mission 4.7. The Sustainable Development Goal 4 calls for quality education for all, uh, from pre-K through uh, lifelong learning. It is more vital than ever, especially in this period of mass disruption of education. But one of the uh, pillars of SDG 4.7, uh, thanks so much to the great leadership of Ban Ki-moon, who we'll hear from in just a moment, is the target 4.7. It says that by 2030, all learners should acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including among others, education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of culture's contributions to sustainable development. 
So here we have the call for universal education for sustainable development, that's Laudato C, si, and universal education for fraternity and for encounter and for dialogue. And that is the commitment for global citizenship and the appreciation of cultural diversity. So it is utterly fitting that we launch Mission 4.7 a global effort to ensure the fulfillment of this wonderful target, this wonderful goal of universal education for sustainable development and global citizenship in partnership and inspired by Pope Francis and by Pope Francis's global compact on education, which calls for the renewal of education in the spirit of global understanding and global peace. I want to thank UNESCO and its wonderful leadership. Uh, we'll hear from uh, the Director General in just a moment, uh, to Ban Ki-moon and the Ban Ki-moon uh, Foundation, Ban Ki-moon Center for uh, the former Secretary General's uh, inimitable uh, diplomacy and leadership to establish the sustainable development goals in the first place, and to have the insight to include target 4.7 on education for sustainable development and for global citizenship. Uh, with these partners, uh, with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and its crucial base of the SDG Academy at Sunway University in Kuala Lumpur and with Columbia University, I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to launch mission 4.7 uh, on the occasion of the seventh Vatican Youth Summit. And to do so, we have two patrons of this initiative, the two global patrons of the initiative uh, the Director General of UNESCO, UN Education, a scientific and cultural organization, the part of the UN system responsible for education, science, and cultural appreciation, uh, this crucial institution. The Director General, Audrey Auzule, will join us uh, by video, uh, and uh, then we will hear uh, words of Ban Ki-moon, former Secretary General, and the uh, other patron of Mission 4.7. Sam, if you could uh, run the video, we'll hear from the Director General of UNESCO. Yep, video will run in a moment. Your Holiness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us to launch this most urgent Mission 4.7. Target 4.7 of the Sustainable Development Goals focuses on education for sustainable development and global citizenship. We're gathering today as a year of unforeseen upheaval comes to a close. As we pause for our reflection, let us use this time as a potential circuit breaker for action. The COVID-19 pandemic started as the world came out of the hottest decade in history. We now sit on the precipice of climate catastrophe with irrevocable damage already impacting biospheres and causing unprecedented biodiversity loss. Like war, the climate crisis is the result of human behavior. 2020 has shed light on other existential threats to our societies, racism, gender inequality, the spread of conspiracy theories and hate speech, distrust of science, the rise of antisemitism and violent extremism. When we speak of rebuilding after the COVID-19 pandemic, we must start by uh, what, where, and how we learn so that it can uh, reflect the society that we want. Target 4.7 was included in the Sustainable Development Goals to acknowledge that education must not only be universally accessible, but also meaningful and empowering. 
UNESCO prioritizes target 4.7 as a reminder that education is not only a goal in itself, it is also a means to achieve all the other SDGs, an enabler of change. Target 4.7 speaks to UNESCO's core mandate and mission to build lasting peace and foster open, equal and inclusive societies through education, sciences, culture and communication. In our globalized and interconnected world, this mandate is carried out today through our programs in uh, Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship Education, which promote holistic and transformational learning. This means not only developing new learning content that is relevant to the SDGs, but also focusing on learning outcomes, teaching and the learning environment itself to give learners the knowledge, skills, attributes and values they need to be change makers ready for the challenge of tomorrow. UNESCO has just launched a new global framework called ESD for 2030. At the World Conference for ESD Development taking place uh, in May 2021, our member states will present their initiatives to bring nature and sustainable development into the classroom. Through global citizenship education, we are working towards more inclusive educational systems that foster respect for others diversity and human rights. We are training young people who are aware of their responsibilities, capable of driving peace and change and committed to more sustainable societies. Media and information literacy is also a key point that mission 4.7 should address. Today, more than ever, this is needed to fight the disinformation that is threatening the stability and openness of our societies. UNESCO has worked in this field for the past 30 years and has adapted it, its approach to take into account the new challenges of the distribution of information through artificial intelligence or algorithm, for instance. The pandemic, which caused school closures that impacted 90% of learners, has jeopardized hard-won achievements in the SDGs. In response, as you know, UNESCO has led the Global Coalition for Education, which came together to fight to protect access to education. But the pandemic is also an opportunity to rethink the futures of education, building on the lessons learned from the crisis. With this vision in mind, it is my honor to be a patron of Mission 4.7 and launch this initiative, which will support and enrich UNESCO's work on this vital target. Alongside the Honorable Ban Ki-moon and Professor Jeffrey Sachs, we bring together great minds, esteemed members of the global education community with stronger missions and an incredible capacity for innovation. But this initiative also needs commitments of funding and action from governmental and non-governmental partners. For the mission we are launching today together, could not be more urgent or important for the world we need to build tomorrow. We need to uphold global peace, a goal that is as important today as it was 75 years ago. I thank you for your attention. Great, back to you, Professor Sachs. Hi, uh, what a, a great message from Director General Audrey Auzoulé who asks us to uh, reimagine education and to mobilize our efforts and our finances for education for all. And we have a first rendezvous date in May uh, at the education summit that UNESCO will host when countries will be committing to this very agenda. <clears throat> we have a lot of work to do, but fortunately, thanks to Sam and his team and others, uh, a lot is underway. And I ask for all of the youth uh, today and tomorrow in the symposium to be thinking of ways to accelerate our work on bringing education for sustainable development and global citizenship into the classrooms. This is the real purpose of Mission 4.7. Now it is my uh, great honor and delight to introduce 
uh, Secretary General, uh, former Secretary General of the UN, uh, who was on the line. I, is that correct, Sam? Uh, yes, yes. Because I don't see the full screen, so I'm thrilled. Oh. Yes, uh, my, my uh, former boss, and I consider him always my boss, uh, the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, who made possible all of this uh, in uh, two <laughs> unbelievably stunning achievements in uh, 2015, back to back, uh, the uh, adoption of uh, Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, and then followed a few weeks yeah. later by the Paris Climate <laughs> Agreement. Certainly one of the most momentous and successful moments in global diplomacy. I got to watch the world's consummate diplomat at work and uh, don't understand exactly the magic of it, but it happened. Uh, and I know that uh, through his leadership and his guidance, uh, Mission 4.7 will happen also. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. You've been a steadfast leader at every moment for global citizenship. Uh, you've embodied it, you've explained it, you've illustrated it, and now you will be patron uh, with the uh, mm. of this effort. So let me turn the microphone to you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for your very kind introduction. I'm very flattered by what you told me, but you never told me like this way when I was in the office. Now, I'm very much grateful for your very kind word. In fact, uh, he's been saying something in a different uh, aspect. Um, he has been my professor. He has been my teacher. And uh, whatever he said, I really tried to uh, put in action. So uh, please remember that uh, the ideas and all goals on SDGs uh, have come from his uh, ideas. Of course, you know, we discussed this matter with uh, so many member states. Uh, scholars, and uh, I'm very much grateful for his continuing commitment uh, establishing this SDSN. And in fact, uh, I'm now working as uh, honorary chair of this SDSN Korea Network. Now, I used to be the head. I used to be, now I'm honorary, honorary uh, head in the Korea Network, not not in the UN organization. Again, uh, thank you very much. He's, uh, he's my boss now at this time. And again, I, I am very much grateful to uh, His Holiness of Pope Francis for his inspiring, inspiring message. He has been really the leader, a spiritual leader, a really actual leader. Uh, I still remember fondly the excitement he has created and vision he has delivered at the United Nations on the very day of the adopting this sustainable development goals. That was a September 25th. And the member state had uh, convened a special session only in honor of uh, His Holiness Pope Francis. He addressed uh, more than hundreds of 50 heads of state and government and the ministers and all delegations. And there was electrifying, you know, a, a moment when he delivered and he blessed, he had given blessings to all the leaders of the world that blessing these sustainable development goals. We have seen many uh, such experiences when after beautiful concert, there is a standing ovation, but I have never seen such a long lasting standing ovations without any end. So this is what I've been telling and I'm deeply, uh, deeply grateful for his uh, continuing uh, leadership and his Leodato uh, Si really has made uh, climate change agreement uh, possible. Again, uh, I'm deeply grateful for his um, participation today and his continuing leadership. And also I'd like to thank His Excellency Monsignor Marcelo Sorondo, uh, Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, co-chair of the mission 4.7. Uh, whatever we have been doing with, uh, he has been, uh, the Monsignor, 
you know, Sorondo has been behind, behind the scene. And I'm sure that uh, Pope uh, has participated because of his urging. Thank you very much uh, for your leadership again. And of course, you know, I am very happy to uh, uh, listen the message, very important messages by my co-patron of Mission 4.7, uh, Her Excellency Madame Odi Azule, Director General of the UNESCO, whom I met uh, last year when I was able to travel uh, in UNESCO headquarters. And we discussed about uh, how to implement uh, 4.7, how to really uh, foster uh, global citizenship among uh, young people. And now we have all, uh, uh, every impo important person now, I'd like to also thank the uh, recognized the co-chairs, uh, Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General uh, of Education UNESCO, and also uh, uh, Jeffrey Chair, Chair of the Sunway Group, and uh, Sam Loney, uh, Director of Global Schools, DSDSN, and uh, many excellencies and honorable participants and dear global citizens. Uh, at while beginning, I'd like to quote what uh, His uh, Holiness of Pope said, I quote, we may prove capable of responding with a new vision of fraternity uh, between all men and women and social friendship that will not remain at the level of words. Let us dream then as a single human family, as fellow travelers sharing the same flesh as a children of the same earth, which is our common home, each of us bringing the richness of his or her beliefs and convictions, each of us with his or her own voice, brothers and sisters all. I end of quote. This is what His Holiness Pope Francis wrote, Fratelli Tutti. Uh, from the Christian convictions that inspire and sustain him. And he has a soul to make this reflection on invitation to dialogue among all people of goodwill. The global compact on education is also a testament to his commitment to educate humanity about these principles. I thank him for his leadership. And it is my great pleasure to join you today at the Vatican Youth Symposium on intergenerational gathering for sustainable development, bringing together leaders in global development to catalyze the solutions and partnerships for the sustainable development goals. Uh, today, I'm proud to launch the mission 4.7 along with my core Patron Director General of UNESCO, Madame Audrey Ajule. It is a vital initiative to advocate for and work to ensure that all leaders acquire the values, knowledge, and skills needed to promote global citizenship and sustainable development globally. When the SDG was established in September 2015, it was clear that to achieve this ambitious agenda, ensuring access to quality education would be essential. I have become a missionary of SDG. I'm always wearing this SDG badge everywhere, every time, every time. On the SDG form, quality education, target 4.7 calls for the implementation of education that is inclusive and that promotes sustainable development. It underlines the need to foster global citizenship and empower all learners to be active in our efforts to achieve the SDGs. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we only have 10 years left to achieve the SDGs. This means that we must act swiftly and collaboratively. COVID-19 has challenged international cooperation, strained the national capacities, 
and exacerbated inequalities. With regard to education, even prior to the pandemic, inclusive and equitable quality education was advancing at too slow a pace. Overall, five years after this adoption, now the progress level is uneven, depending upon where people are living. And we must make sure that um, within 10 years, we have to really make sure that all these SDG 17 goals are implemented. Now, with 90% of all the students out of school, because of the school closures caused by COVID-19, we risk taking steps backwards. It is a critical time to share a call to action and to launch this initiative, Mission 4.7, aimed to advocate for, inspire, and mobilize governmental and non-governmental actors to prioritize education for sustainable development. Mission 4.7 will facilitate and support the exchange of good practices and mutual learning, as well as mobilize resources and promote the engagement of champion, champions for education, establishing innovative partnerships with the diverse actors at the global and national level. We must raise the next generations to be global citizens, to act with passion and compassion when, when addressing the world's challenges. Both in my capacity as the former Secretary General of the United Nations and now as co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, I am honored to accept the role of patron uh, to this mission. The Ban Ki-moon Center stands ready to build Mission 4.7 with a co-organizing partner UNESCO, the SDSN, and the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. In Seoul, Korea, I have also established to reinforce my capacity in Ban Ki-moon Center uh, in Vienna. In Seoul, Ban Ki-moon Foundation for a Better Future. You see uh, the logo behind me and uh, I'm using all, all organizations to promote these SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, together, we must seize this moment to push this imperative initiative forward. Let us work together to educate humanity about sustainable development and global citizenship with the necessary knowledge, skills, and empathy for others, we can create a brighter future for us all, leaving no one behind. And I thank for your commitment. And let's work together to make this world better for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Grazie. Secretary General, thank you so much for the wonderful statement, for your leadership, and uh, with all gratitude for your patronage of this initiative, which will be absolutely phenomenal and, and essential. We are organized uh, in this project with several uh, different uh, groups that are all uh, critical for the success of our effort, uh, including uh, four co-chairs representing the uh, four organizations coming together for this purpose, of course, the Holy See uh, and uh, Pope Francis and uh, uh, represented uh, by Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, uh, Sunway uh, Foundation and Sunway University, uh, led by uh, the chairman uh, of Sunway uh, Foundation and of uh, the chancellor and founder of Sunway University, Jeffrey Chia, uh, and the Assistant Director General of UNESCO, Stefania Giannini. And we have many other wonderful leaders uh, as part of the high-level advisory group, Jennifer Gross of the Blue Chip Foundation, Betsy Parker, the uh, longtime 
founder and patron of uh, this uh, seminar, this uh, symposium series, the Vatican Youth Symposium, who's been with uh, this symposium from the start and a great friend and supporter and many other leaders in education that you'll be hearing from uh, shortly uh, as a part of our program. But for the next uh, three speakers, I'd like to call on the co-chairs of Mission 4.7, starting with the Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I am very happy to collaborate with you in this great mission, especially after the very important speech of the Pope that recognized that the, the need that we come back to re restart with edu education, uh, global education, universal education, because he said that the pact of education is broken. So I think that we need to put all our more important force, energies, uh, moral and, and economic, to renew this, this mission of education that uh, I, I say in the beginning, is the more important mission that we can have because it's the transmission of our values to the to the other generations and uh, and of course it is that the most not only for us private but also as governors are also all the institutions especially universities especially college especially other universities but not specifically only the institution of education but all people need to be an educator of the other people. And this is our mission. So I completely agree. And, uh, and of course the Academy and follow the Pope, the Academy of the Pope uh, follow this initiative with great interest. As you know, the Pope sent and launched this new pact in education because he considered that the pact is broken. We need to recom back to this in this moment, especially in this moment when we don't have clear the love in, in the hearts of the people in the country. We have many sensations of words, many sensations of hate, many sensations completely different at the need that we, we need. And I am happy that also in your country there are news important and we can probably come with the collaboration of this great important nation uh, and all the America and of course the European countries, but also Isha. I am very happy that Ban Ki-moon, that I know because he came here and met the Pope here in the Academy, I remember, and was this, uh, this, this meeting the possibility the encounter to speak about education and to speak also to eradicate the new form of slaves, I remember perfectly, and was fantastic moment uh, for, 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 for this meeting. So, of course, come with our collaboration. Marcelo, thank you so much. You are our great, great guide and inspiration uh, and uh, a teacher of the deepest value. So I'm personally so grateful to you and we all are grateful to you for your unique, uh, your really unique uh, leadership. Uh, let me turn to uh, now uh, the leader for education for the UN system uh, and a great educator herself, uh, a uh, uh, linguist, a uh, former Minister of Education of Italy and now Assistant Director General for Education of UNESCO and one uh, of uh, the great proponents and leaders of this effort, uh, Dr. Stefania Giannini. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, thank you very much, Jeff, uh, dear co-chair. It's a great pleasure uh, to, be, to be with all of you today with Monsignor Marcello, uh, the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, and just uh, keeping in my mind uh, 
an inspiring uh, uh, workshop we had uh, a few days before something enormous happened in this world. And it was a bit uh, paving the way February this year uh, to this uh, conversation and the initiative you're launching today. And uh, to be very happy to be with youth from around the world. We are, we are discussing uh, about change, I suppose. Change begins uh, with a vision and takes form through a mission. And uh, this 4.7, uh, in my opinion, is the more revolutionary uh, principle uh, embedded in the 2030 agenda. So let me pay tribute here to the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for his vision in making a global citizenship and education for sustainability a pillar uh, of his uh, Education First initiative uh, eight years ago. And my director, my boss, our director general, uh, Audrey Azoulay, has recalled UNESCO's leadership in uh, taking forward this ambition. And uh, we are absolutely uh, keen to, to contribute, uh, to, to lead uh, besides uh, you uh, uh, on this topic. It's about the, the, the change we need in this century. It's about what uh, Pope Francis, uh, uh, in Laudato Si first and Fratelli Tutti now clearly uh, described as the principles of moral duty that uh, we have to educate the next generation to make this world better than it is. And it's about the taking care. If I should summarize the, the key words for this century, which are really about the core mandate of 4.7 is about taking care, taking care of nature, environment, the planet, taking care of others, understand others' respect in their dignity and cultural diversity is about taking care of ourselves in terms of being a critical citizens, citizens in order to be able to understand what's happening around us and to distinguish between uh, fake and truth and being able to, uh, to uh, develop our own vision for a better society. So it's an ambitious mission, we know very well. Let me say just a few words in my current position with the head of co-chair of this uh, uh, inspiring and fantastic initiative we have, why we call it a mission. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, missions uh, providing solutions, uh, carrying strong societal relevance, uh, set time bound targets, work across uh, sectors and encourage bottom up solutions. What we are, we are going to do in the, in the, in the coming months uh, and years is about that. Uh, our mission has a clear receipt to follow, let me say like this. It brings together in a high level advisory group champions, you already mentioned, uh, Jeff, uh, many of them from beyond the world of education, because this is not simply about transforming education, uh, but it's about the power of education to transform society in, 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 in its function of transmitting values to the next generation. And it's about an investment in knowledge, in skills, in mindsets for learning the ropes of peace and sustainability. But on the other side, let me say that our approach is a very practical one as well. Connected research, policy, action, and evidence. This target is not an add-on its nature calls for uh, embedding it across uh, curriculum development, uh, connecting learning with life, uh, problem solving, aptitude, uh, critical thinking, creativity to nurture global questions. So a lot of skills for life and not simply skills, uh, knowledge base and not simply skills for job, for a better job, which is of course another important dimension. And this mission will create, I'm sure, and curate resources for teaching and learning and build an online repository of such materials, documents from around the world. This is like a platform we are establishing today. And it will bring together 
different constituents and communities, the students, educators, policymakers, professionals, but I'm, I'm sure also many, many citizens of the world who feel the urgency we have and the need we don't postpone this important uh, moral duty we have. This is about also reorienting as an educator, let me say a few last words, reorienting teaching and learning at every level. And it's about instilling in every student's awareness, knowledge and behaviors. And uh, it's about a chain of values which can really contribute to transform the world around us and to contribute to make this world a bit better. We have opportunity uh, this year, uh, in the coming year, I mean uh, 2021, to influence the, the global uh, public debate about this urgency we feel in this room at the G7, at the G20, at the COP26. And my mission 4.7 must be for all, not simply for educators, students, uh, teachers, and uh, people who are in the, in, the, in the field of education. This mission gives me, let me say, really a, a true sense of optimism about the future because, uh, you know, we are under the, 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 the Pope Francis blessing, inspirational vision, leadership, spiritual leadership, and uh, it brings together his wisdom, influence, and uh, uh, capacity to, to really make the change needed possible. And I thank you very much for this wonderful partnership and so excited to contribute personally and uh, as uh, Assistant Director General for Education in my great organization, UNESCO. Thank you. Stefania, thank you for those wonderful words and uh, for all of your guidance and inspiration for us. It will be really a joy to work together. And I think as everybody is saying, and I want to underscore an obvious point, we cannot achieve any of the SDGs if we don't put education, unless we put education at the center. Uh, it is knowledge and goodwill and global citizenship that makes possible everything else that we're trying to do. And if we don't succeed on SDG 4, we will not succeed on the rest, but we can succeed on SDG 4. That's why we're here together today and why it's so exciting and why I'm delighted to uh, introduce now our fourth co-chair of Mission 4.7, a great entrepreneur and a great pioneer in sustainable development in uh, real world fabulous uh, projects. Uh, the founder of a wonderful university, Sunway University, uh, he's the chairman of the Sunway Group, the chancellor of Sunway University, uh, and a great benefactor of global education uh, Sunway University hosts uh, SDSN throughout Asia. It hosts the uh, SDG Academy, which is the online initiative globally for sustainable development at the university level. Uh, he's made it possible and promoted it. We have a full, uh, as Stefania said, a, a full library of online, freely accessible, high quality a training in sustainable development. And our goal is to build and build and build. And this year in the midst of COVID, Sunway University pioneered a global online, all online master's degree in sustainable development to keep the initiative moving forward. That's all to say we have a, a great innovator and entrepreneur uh, and a visionary as our fourth co-chair. It's my honor to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Jeffrey Chia. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Your Holiness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you from Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur, here in Malaysia. Of course, uh, it is about 10, uh, 10 p.m. now in Malaysia. 
I'm honored to be invited to deliver some brief remarks as co-chairman of Mission 4.7. <clears throat> Let me begin by thanking His Holiness Pope Francis for launching this global initiative. Mission 4.7 is being undertaken at a critical moment in the history of the planet and its people. You are all familiar with the challenges we face. And unless we act and act now to educate our younger generation, I fear for their future and the world they will inherit. To quote an old Chinese saying, if you plan if, if your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees. If your plan is for 100 years, educate children. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us here at Sunway Group are determined to do our part towards advancing the sustainable development agenda. I am grateful to the UN SDSN for establishing Sunway University located at Sunway City Kuala Lumpur here as one of the three UN SDSN centers to oversee continent-wide sustainability initiatives. The three are New York City, which oversees the Americas, Paris for Europe and Africa, and Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur for Asia. I am delighted that Sunway University will host the United Nations SDSN SDG Academy, which will play a fundamental role in Mission 4.7. All of us at Sunway regard this responsibility not only as an honor, but an obligation. We believe it also testifies to our firm commitment in advancing the sustainable development agenda. This commitment is summed up in Sunway's vision statement, which is to be Asia's model cooperation in sustainable development, innovating to enrich lives for a better tomorrow. And ladies and gentlemen, to provide some context, the very birth of the Sunway Group was founded in the concept of sustainable development. It began with the construction of Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia first integrated green township. Four decades ago, Sunway City, Kuala Lumpur was an abandoned land of disused pools caused by destructive mining activity. We set about rehabilitating the 800 acres land. More than 30,000 trees have been transplanted and a complete ecosystem restored with lots of flora and fauna. We also, we also have our own public transport system with electric buses running on specially designed elevated bus lanes. In addition, Elevated covered walkways connect the city, which provide a healthy and alternative means of getting around. These walkways also reduce our carbon footprint. We have built many certified green buildings. We constructed and commissioned our own water treatment plant. It recycles and purifies water from our two sunken ex-mining lakes to serve our community. We have also initiated a whole range of energy saving and efficiency measures. Sunway City Kuala Lumpur is now home to a driving community of more than 200,000 people living, working, playing, and studying in a safe, healthy, and connected environment. It is home to three universities with, ho with hostel facilities for some 10,000 students. One of Asia's largest shopping malls, Malaysia, Malaysia's first theme park, a 1,100 bed private hospital, three 
international class hotels, private residences and commercial towers. All these are built, owned and managed by Sunway. And we are not finished yet. We plan to integrate technology even more deeply to establish Sunway City Kuala Lumpur as a model smart sustainable city of the 21st century. This unique mix of young talent, intellectual firepower, research expertise, innovation labs, and commercial activities has helped shape Sunway City into a living laboratory providing real world solutions in real time. Without being boastful, perhaps what we have achieved was best summed up by the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the former Prime Minister of Singapore. When he and his wife visited us in Sunway City, he said, and I quote, oh, this is what entrepreneurship is about. How wonderful. You have transformed a wasteland into a wonderland. I would like to extend a personal invitation to all of you good people to come visit us when travel restrictions are lifted. Ladies and gentlemen, the success and growth of Sunway enabled me to realize my lifelong dream, which was to set up a foundation dedicated to nation building and giving back to society. The Jeffrey Chia Foundation has awarded scholarships and grants amounting to more than 150 million US dollars. The foundation also gifted 10 million US dollars to the UNSDSN to set up the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable, on Sustainable Development at Sunway University five years ago. Of course, the, SEC, the center, as you know, is named after my good friend, Professor Sachs who is also the chairman. This year, the foundation has again pledged about 10 million US dollars to the UNSDSN for use over the next five years, beginning from 2021. A substantial amount of this gift will be, will be used to help fund the activities of SDG Academy at Sunway University. And ladies and gentlemen, I have always believed that one must have a higher purpose in life. For me personally, that purpose is to lead a fulfilling life by giving back to society and building a better world for our children. Advancing the sustainability agenda is very much part of this mission. Our efforts at Sunway and the Jeff Richard Foundation are driven by the conviction that realizing the 17 SDGs is not the responsibility of governments alone. Building a sustainable future requires the commitment of all elements of society, the private sector, academia, civil society, and of course, every single individual. We are all in this together, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Jeffrey, thank you for your vision, your uh, incredible capacity to realize your vision uh, for your leadership. And I can tell you, as you were speaking uh, along the chats, uh, so many people are proud of Malaysia also, but they're saying how great they wish they could be home. <laughs> but this is very nice, uh, wonderful news for Malaysia also. So we're so thrilled and uh, we'll do a good job together. This is uh, what, a, what an incredible opportunity. Well, we have many leaders uh, of uh, this work uh, that we're going to now hear from in the next three sessions. Uh, members of the high level advisory group and members uh, of the uh, special academic and NGO advisory groups, world leading educators. And it's a great treat for me to now introduce uh, the moderator for the next session. Uh, now that we have launched, now we're going to find out in detail how to do it. And we're going to be starting on education 
in primary and secondary schools, Education for Sustainable Development. And our moderator is Monica Perler, who is the CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens and does such a fantastic job. Monica gets us together in all parts of the world to brainstorm on the future. Uh, Monica, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for the partnership and let me turn the microphone over to you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. We are all inspired by the words that we have just heard by His Holiness and by all of the other eminent speakers. Ban Ki-moon, it's, it's a pleasure to have all of you gathered here today. Welcome to session two. We are, as Jeffrey said, delving right into the midst of it. We are going to look at education for sustainable development in primary and secondary schools. And indeed, as you all know, unfortunately, COVID-19 has disrupted education for millions of children across the globe. And it is our task today and for the years to come to reimagine and redesign education, to build back better. And this pertains to school curricula, and it, there should definitely be a greater focus on SDG 4.7 and links to climate change. So this session that we are starting here now will actually discuss ways to embed these concepts of sustainable development in the K-12 school curricula. And we want to present to you strong cases why ESD is so important. So why does the world benefit from teaching 21st century skills and global citizenship to young leaders? To find that out, I have the pleasure to introduce to you amazing speakers today. We will have the pleasure of still being joined by Mrs. Stefania Giannini, Assistant Director General for Education. Also, we will hear from Amanda Abram, Program, Office, Program Manager of the Global Schools, STSN. We have the privilege of having Dr. Andreas Schleicher with us. He's the Director of Education and Skills at OECD. Then Dr. Siva Kumari is joining us. She's Director General of the International Baccalaureate Organization. And we have the privilege of having two professors, one professor, Mustafa Öztürk. He's professor at a university in Turkey, namely the Hacettepe University, and Professor Abdul Karim Marzouk. He's the Director of the Executive Education Center at al Wayne University in Morocco. Before we begin, let me just do brief housekeeping again. So this event is live on YouTube, as you know. We will start by hearing another statement by Stefania Giannini. We will then watch a short video of voices that are supportive of Mission 4.7 and then switch immediately to the panel. Now with the panelists, we will hear statements by them, but all of you in the audience are strongly encouraged to let us know your questions and also to interact with each other during the session. We have Q&A, hopefully time permits, and at the end we will stop with a so-called lightning round where each of the panelists will give one snapshot of what we should take away. Please keep your microphones off unless you are a speaker. Um, watch that there is simultaneous translation for those of you who need it, and keep on your cameras. We like to speak to you, to the people, and see you, and please use the hashtags as was mentioned before. So without much further ado, Dear Stefania Giannini, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education, who is really one of the top UN officials in the field of implementing the Education 2030 Agenda, please give us your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Uh, we are now going, uh, as you said, uh, in this session, uh, to the real substance of the mission 4.7 uh, from the angle of curriculum development and the importance uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, this uh, ESD uh, and global citizenship uh, uh, for uh, changing the model we teach and we learn today. So let's, let's, let me start with a, with a very concrete example uh, to, to quote. This is the case of uh, a primary school uh, uh, in Zimbabwe uh, where uh, a, one of our laureates uh, of UNESCO Annual Education for Sustainable Development Prize, um, uh, you know, uh, implemented a very, very interesting uh, project on the ground. It's about uh, the school uh, started uh, up uh, uh, a permaculture program that has taught uh, some uh, 700 students how to reduce deforestation, recycle uh, waste matter, 
produce uh, food and manage land. So very concrete actions uh, in, a, in a part, uh, in a region of the world where these issues are really very much about uh, uh, managing the, 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 the development, but also, you know, daily life and how they improve uh, the, the, their own daily life. So this is to say that I take this example because uh, it, uh, among many others we can, we can refer to, it embodies the principles of education for sustainable development, a, a whole school approach that is inclusive, particip participatory, um, practical, and sensitive to contest, to the contest where the school is based. To, uh, to, to, to cut it short, I, 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 th I think we have to see that we cannot learn how to protect your own environment, or also on the other side of the coin about global citizenship, prevent conflict, combat prejudice, uh, or misinformation, through a textbook or an academic exercise alone. Of course, it's important. I said before, uh, it's about knowledge first, but the second immediate step is about awareness. And then the third step is about uh, changing behaviors and try to influence mindset in order to change behavior around the school, uh, in the school uh, uh, contest. And this is to say, uh, uh, about uh, um, you know the, the call uh, of uh, of mission point point seven and the, the education for sustainable development is a call for radical transformation in teaching and learning practices. We must say very clearly, uh, education must transform itself in order to be able to transform society. And this shift is not is only in its uh, childhood. <coughs> Let me say like this. Our education systems uh, worldwide, sorry, <clears throat> remain uh, strongly focused on uh, academic achievement alone, or mostly uh, focusing on that. And, uh, and we have uh, really to uh, introduce uh, an holistic approach to these topics, as they are holistic in their purpose and the, in the ambition they, they carry on. But the skills that underline target 4.7 can help also to improve education uh, quality across the board. Co this is about combining the cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral dimensions of learning. And this is what makes us truly human. I said a bit before, knowledge and understanding connecting to, connected to empathy, and the sense of belonging to a, a common humanity and the sense of belonging to your own community. So valorizing the identity of being part of your own community. In all this, uh, uh, in all this dimension, uh, we find the motivation to act in ways that uh, uh, can benefit others in our society. And this is very much about uh, thinking differently and acting very much differently from what we are doing or what we are doing, being done so far. According to uh, a study UNESCO conducted in a selection of countries from all regions of the world, the behavioral dimension received the least attention in programs on education for sustainable development and global citizenship with social emotional skills given slightly more consideration, but far less than cognitive ones. Neuroscience today tells us very clearly the importance of connecting these three areas of for learning to take uh, hold them and be transformative. But education systems have not yet integrated this vision. So our job about this uh, Mission 4.7 initiative is very much discussing with our colleagues, educators, teachers, uh, uh, principals of schools, uh, uh, also, you know, uh, ministers of education and uh, their teams, uh, how we can uh, embed better these principles and going beyond the more, strictly speaking, academic dimension. A last point uh, is about the need of accelerating this transformation. Uh, some previous speakers already touched upon this point. 
So what are the levers to accelerate the transformation we have in our hands? Of course, international organizations uh, play a key role, in my opinion, by providing platforms for dialogue, providing a platform for sharing good experiences. And we have seen these with Education for Sustainable Development, uh, UNESCO uh, is doing uh, uh, is, is carrying on uh, uh, its mandate uh, on that, uh, and we are launching next year uh, a new framework on this specific topic. Uh, and Germany will be the hosting country of a big conference in Berlin, uh, where this uh, this platform will be launched. But uh, of course, uh, uh, this doesn't happen overnight when it's about uh, a change in the mindset, a change in the model uh, of learning and teaching is, is not something that we can uh, achieve in a while, we know. It requires expertise from universities, uh, civil society organizations, uh, and institutions like the Banking Moon Centers, uh, which has the leadership on these topics, uh, to build capacities concretely on the ground. And the same process, uh, of course, uh, uh, holds uh, true for global citizenship. It's a concept that it takes time, definitely, uh, to unpack and to translate uh, into daily practices. Uh, still, UNESCO is working very much on that. Uh, we have a, a competency framework called global citizenship education, uh, which is uh, helping to shape national education strategies. Uh, could mention some countries which are very much uh, committed to, to, to translate uh, and put in practice these principles uh, Camb from Cambodia to Colombia uh, and uh, passing through the Sahel region. So uh, it's a still uh, a real common uh, work to be, to, to be done together. Uh, and it's uh, about a target which is not, uh, let me say, uh, a technical issue uh, related simply to some uh, uh, small amendments or uh, modifications to be put uh, in teachers' training or in curriculum development. All these dimensions I try to summarize briefly are really uh, very much important to give us the technical and uh, knowledge platform to, uh, to accelerate uh, uh, the, the mission for 0.7. And uh, I think, uh, I do believe that uh, this initiative uh, uh, really should contribute to, to develop a more solid evidence uh, uh, based uh, around the target for 0.7. Uh, uh, and uh, it's about uh, accelerating the SDG4 uh, roadmap as a whole and the true SDG4 and uh, as my co-chair, Professor Sachs mentioned before, uh, it's about achieving all the other goals of the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very inspirational and very insightful and dense with information. Uh, I take away that, yes, we do need a holistic approach. We need to change our minds. We need to have a discussion competency framework will be key and acceleration will be key. Allow me still to follow up with one question to you. As we are approaching Christmas, people are formulating wish lists. And I would like to know, um, what would you see Mission 4.7 should fulfill? What would be on your wish list? And what is something that you might not want to take along? What is something that you do want to take along? UNESCO has come so far when it comes to SDG 4. UNESCO has done an incredible job of leadership, but I'm sure that there are condensed lessons learned that you would like to see Mission 4.7 to carry forward and others that you might not want to see to be carried forward. What would it be in a nutshell? Well, let me say this is a special Christmas for all of us. No, it's still uh, within uh, an unprecedented situation we're living in all regions of the world. And uh, it's a Christmas where we can already wrap up about some lessons learned uh, in, the, in the last uh, few months. In education, uh, the, we, 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 we lived the, 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 you know, the, the, the more disruptive uh, 
uh, impact uh, we have we never saw in uh, in history with uh, 1.7 billion children out of school and schools because of the closure of course uh, that many countries were somehow obliged to decide and uh, uh, we we also uh, uh, saw uh, governments and school systems relying on uh, e-learning on uh, as we are doing today by the way <laughs> uh, and on technology so the more we leverage technology the more we see technology becoming uh, an important component of innovation in education and uh, education for the for the future and the more it's important in my opinion uh, to leverage the content component of education. And uh, these two sides of the same coin, as I said a bit before, taking care through education, within education, of nature and the planet, and taking care of others and ourselves as uh, main actors of uh, our destiny and the destiny of the entire humanity according to our behaviors, uh, individual behaviors and collective behaviors. I think uh, this is the good balance we have to find uh, uh, under this special Christmas tree this year. And I'm sure that uh, we are on the right track and I'm sure that uh, together we can get it. Thanks so much. I do know that you have to attend to pressing business and hence I would like to thank you at this stage for your very valuable contributions. It's always a privilege to work with UNESCO, with you, with of course DG Audrey Azoulay, because UNESCO has literally achieved a lot. Ten more years to go for the SDGs. We are pressed in time, there is urgency, and we are all keenly observing Germany and May and what will what will be basically launched with a new framework in May next year. We will eagerly be waiting. Thank you very much, Stefania Giannini. Thank you. With that, I would like to turn to the video, the video of supporting voices, two supporting voices from the Middle East for Mission 4.7. One of these voices is by Dr. Tariq al -Gurk. He He's the Chief Executive Officer of Dubai Cares. And another voice is Mr. Dino Varki, who is Chief Executive Officer of GEMS Education. And I do hope that the regie, that the technical helpers can now play the video that is their remarks summarizing their support for Mission 4.7. I'll jump in here and share it just one moment. Wonderful, thank you so much. Target 4.7 is key to make all of the SDGs a reality because it provides learners with the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development and global citizenship. Dubai Cares plays an instrumental role in helping achieve SDG 4 as it has successfully launched education programs reaching over 20 million beneficiaries in 60 developing countries since its inception in 2007. As part of its global advocacy efforts, Dubai Cares will be hosting Rewired Summit in December 2021. This global education summit that will be held in person at Expo 2020 Dubai site during the Knowledge and Learning Week will serve as a timely reminder for countries to fast track their efforts to achieve the SDG4 targets while showcasing success stories from around the world and exploring how these could be scaled up for enhanced global impact. We wish 4.7 all the best in its efforts and we remain committed to working closely with Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens and all global stakeholders to make progress towards achieving SDG4. At GEM Schools, 
we care about a values-led education and seek to encourage our students to develop this mindset. We nurture our students to show all the qualities of kindness, respect, empathy, helpfulness, and compassion to their friends, family, and the wider global community. Mission 4.7 is an effort to support the education of a generation of global leaders with global citizenship values, real tangible knowledge of the SDGs, and 21st century skills that we believe is the real path to improving the state of our world for all. Since 1968, we at GEMS Education have been driven by a singular purpose, to provide a quality education to every child and every learner, no matter where they are in the world. We hope that Mission 4.7 will be equally successful and want to congratulate everyone on the launch today. Let us raise our ambition to inspire a generation of future leaders and change makers. So ladies and gentlemen, mission 4.7, and with that implicitly, you have also seen a logo that will provide us with a banner for the effort that we are undertaking. Gillian, thanks so much for helping us with the video. So indeed, we're gonna go to the panel discussion now, and I'm very, very curious to hear what our high level experts have to say. What we want to explore in this panel discussion is very much multifold. We are talking K-12 education, we are talking primary and secondary education, but particularly how can GCED and ESD meet the challenges of the future of work, the future of life? I'd even claim the future of humanity. Do we need to rethink schools? So this is a very bold question, but this is something that I would like to hear from our panelists. I also would like to hear how far have we come and what are the barriers that persist? What does it need for a transition? So can you give us practical examples and can they be scaled? So you can see I as a moderator have plenty of questions and I want to get the insights by our panelists and we will start with Amanda Abram. She is program manager of Global Schools and an expert in the intersection of SDG 4.7, teacher professional development and K-12 education. So Amanda, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Monica. I'll also be speaking as well with the um, director of Global Schools, um, Sam Loney. So he will start it off and then I will continue talking about Global Schools. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. And thank you, Monica. Um, and once again, on behalf of Global Schools and the SDSN, we're very proud of this initiative. Uh, two years ago, when we proposed the idea, we could have never imagined it would gain so much traction. And again, it's thanks to the incredible partnership of the patrons and co-chairs, but also uh, colleagues such as Monica, Chandrika, Alexander, and the rest of the team. It also shows what a great appetite there is out there for this topic and, and its importance. So we're very excited for the uh, journey ahead. Uh, but I think one of you asked some uh, very important questions. And, and I think one of the main ones is, what was the motivation behind such an initiative? Um, and, and why do we need such an initiative? Uh, and, and I think there's a story in this. Um, there are approximately 1.4 billion children in school around the world at the moment. And the uh, most important question is, are we doing enough to prepare these children for a future? Are we uh, equipping them with the necessary knowledge uh, values uh, and skills to better navigate this very uncertain future that's awaiting them, uh, but also to give them the actual agency and empowerment to build resilient and prosperous uh, community. Uh, COVID-19 has shown how fragile this system is and, and why individuals need to have the critical thinking uh, capabilities as well as systems thinking and many, many other important uh, uh, learning domains that, uh, uh, you know, Her Excellency Stefania Giannini uh, referred to. And of course, education for sustainable development is a, a key enabler for this uh, transformation. Um, but uh, we also have to recognize that many public um, education systems around the world are overstretched, uh, underfunded, and dealing with even the most basic challenges of education, 
which in part might explain the limitations in the implementation and scaling of education for uh, sustainable development. And, you know, multiple UNESCO reports have, have, have pointed out to this, that um, even at the very classroom levels, at, at the very classroom level, teachers are struggling to uh, fit in the entire curriculum and dealing with uh, the, the, the challenges of the existing content, let alone additional content. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we, we know, and these are uh, recent studies that have that have shown, in particular one from uh, Stanford University, which has done a, a, you know a, a systemic and a systematic analysis of of a number of other studies, which show that education for sustainable development is not just good for society, but it's also good for education. It increases uh, student engagement in class. Uh, it uh, creates a better school environment. It uh, you know increases teacher satisfaction. Uh, it increases attendance, and there are many many other benefits which actually can uh, help the very basic um, uh, tenets of education. And this 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 uh, this systematic approach, I think, is is clearly so. As uh, advocates of sustainable development, we really need to work very closely with the national governments and to offer support where necessary in designing and implementing uh, a high quality uh, ESD uh, curriculum, but also a comprehensive training of uh, teachers to enable them to as easily transition into this new model of curriculum. So this transformation really uh, is key. And for that, there needs to be very clear thinking about the localization process. So really, we, we also need to um, uh, better define what uh, ESD is and how it will uh, look in, in different settings, that it, it is not just about environmental education, but a whole spectrum of other issues, including uh, global citizenship, 21st century skills, and human rights. Um, and of course, and I think the most important part of this is partnering with national uh, research institutions, universities, think tanks, and of course, the various ministries to create these uh, comprehensive uh, courses, but also to localize them to ensure that they're not just one class over the uh, uh, you know the lifetime of the student, but rather a comp a, a critical component of uh, of education in uh, every step of the way, and of course to uh, scale uh, to monitor the results and be able to scale that. So I think these are all very important and. I think uh, establishing these principles uh, can be very helpful and then working um, at the local level. The late Sir Ken Robinson said that um, uh, education is not a mechanical process, it's, it's an organic process. And what can we do to support education systems around the world organically really aspire to these very, very important uh, transformations that we need. At global schools, we truly wanted to understand the problems and the limitations at the local level and to find out what it would really take to transform learning and repurpose the curriculum at the national level, despite these limitations. So 12 months ago, actually, we started our research pilot program in three countries, Ghana, uh, Turkey, and Morocco. We did this in partnership with uh, Mohammed VI uh, Foundation for Environmental Protection and the al Ahwan University in Morocco, Millennium Promise and University of Education in Ghana, and the Hasatepe University in Turkey. We were also extremely lucky to have the support of our wonderful academic advisors during this pr process, including uh, professors Oren Pismani levy uh, Felicia Sibis uh, from Columbia University, Professor Fernando Remus from Harvard, and Professor Alan Reed from Monash, who guided us through this localization process and really um, uh, helped us uh, you know, create a, a, a comprehensive process for, for the nationalization of curriculum. So 12 months later, we're very happy to announce that since last year, more than 60 researchers have been recruited across three countries to lead this project. They have worked across four separate uh, languages, three different national education systems, and these languages are English, Turkish, Arabic, and French. They have been uh, working very hard to audit the curriculum and the textbooks. They've been identifying and understanding the gaps and limitations. And more importantly, now they've been using this information, uh, uh, we've been using this information uh, for uh, understanding where the interventions are necessary to design the relevant curriculum content, to design the lesson plans to be integrated into the national curriculum. And of course, some incredible results have emerged and, and you will hear about these 
shortly. Now, we're now in the final phase of this uh, research project and a report will be coming to you very soon. And most importantly, we hope that this methodology and experience of our partners and these three countries will be used as a basis for the localization work of Mission 4.7 as we we'll begin working with various national and local uh, governments. We, in other words, we want um, this methodology and experience to build on the on the wonderful existing work of UNESCO and essentially serve as a toolkit for the localization of the SDGs and their integration into uh, curriculum. But of course also as a way to support teachers and students uh, to transform learning within the classroom. So we're very excited for the journey ahead. And as Global Schools, we are looking to replicate these success stories in other countries through Mission 4.7. And with that, I hand over to my colleague, Amanda Abram, to highlight some of the Global Schools work on the ground. Amanda, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Sam. So what you've heard so far is since its inception, Global Schools has really been able to accomplish incredible work in collaboration with its partners and researchers to make a true impact in this space. But also we're doing a lot in the advocacy front on the grassroots front to really impact every student and lifelong learner. And now as one of the founding partners of Mission 4.7, we can really continue this work and take it forward. So last year we trained 450 community volunteers on the importance of education for sustainable development. These volunteers are known as global schools advocates and we tasked them with taking the SDGs to K to 12 students that are in the school communities that are the most left behind where they can understand the local context and speak in the local languages to these school leaders, teachers and students. And their mission was to motivate school communities to take up education for sustainable development. And and they successfully completed presentations at 2,000 school communities and reached out to 7,700 schools about sustainable development education. And we have a variety of stories, um, impact stories about these advocates, which I'd love to share. Um, briefly, I will say we had a story from an advocate in Bangladesh. And what they did is they understood the local community context around um, SDG 6 clean water and realized that motivating that school leader to work on a water water filtration system within the school community was the best way to educate students about the environment and about the SDGs and take this forward in curricula and operations. Um, so through this work of the advocates, about a thousand schools in 80 countries encompassing 45,000 teachers and 850,000 students have pledged now to go forward with global schools and integrate um, education for sustainable development within their school curricula and operations. And we really believe that this is evidence that with the proper roadmap and with the proper inspiration from the these local advocates that schools can and schools will join this global movement. And going forward, we are going to be deepening our impact in these school communities by hosting our first cohort of global schools, advocates specifically for teachers. And the purpose of this is to train teachers on these concepts and create community focal points with the ability to influence the knowledge, actions, and behaviors of K-12 students within the local context. We've also in the past partnered with International Baccalaureate to coordinate a campaign which generated 632 sustainability projects with students across the world in IB schools. So going forward, we really believe that through the support of Mission 4.7, as well as the other founders and partners of Mission 4.7, that we will achieve this vision of successfully promoting high quality, localized education for sustainable development across school communities. SDG 4.7, as we have heard from all of the speakers, is really about educating the future generations on how to achieve this agenda. And we believe that in the future, these younger generations, these K to 12 students, they will be at the forefront of these future movements. They will be at the future Vatican Youth Symposium. And these students are going to be setting the new sustainable development agenda beyond the SDGs, beyond 2030. And they need this education in order to advocate um, for these concepts and values throughout history. 
So Global Schools really looks forward to expanding its work through Mission 4.7 and advocating for education for sustainable development to, governor, um, to governments as well as to K-12 students and all lifelong learners. Um, thank you so much and I'm looking forward to the questions and panel discussion. Excellent. Sam and Amanda, how, how passionate are you about it? It's wonderful to hear what Global Schools has already achieved. And particularly, Sam, when you were alluding to the case studies that we are looking at, we can learn a lot from Ghana, Turkey, Morocco, and we have the opportunity to, to get into that in more detail, actually, with other speakers. I do see that there is very active engagement on the chat, which I gladly encourage. So please do jot down your question, jot down ideally also your country and address the question to the panelists directly because we will pick them up, we will collect them and come back to them later. So if you have a question to Sam or to Amanda, make a note at the side. I already see one here for Sam directly. However, before we do the Q and A's, we will go to the next speaker, which is Dr. Andreas Schleicher. Dr. Andreas Schleicher is the Director for Education and Skills at the OECD, and he initiated and oversees the Program for International Student Assessment. Many of you will know that as PISA and many other international instruments. He has worked over 20 years with ministers and educational leaders to improve education. So Dr. Andreas Schleicher, let me pass the floor to you for your statement. Thanks so much, Monica, and thanks for inviting me. <laughs> These are clearly you know, very challenging times for education, but as we can see here in this panel, it's also the time of both extraordinary you know, technological and social innovation in education. In a way, this is the moment ESD has always prepared us for. No? Uh, but at the same time, I think the current COVID crisis is just a massive amplifier and accelerator of many developments that have been with us for some time. No? Globalization, technological change have connected people, you know, countries, continents in ways that have just dramatically improved both our individual and our collective potential. But as we've seen, the same forces have made our uh, you know, world more volatile, more ambiguous, more uncertain. Even, you know, well before COVID, uh, we've seen a growing disconnect between the infinite growth imperative and the finite resources of our planet, between the financial economy and the real economy, between the wealthy and the poor, between the concept of our gross domestic product and the well-being of people, between technology and social needs, between governance and the voicelessness of people. And I'm not saying that schools are responsible for all of that, but I think we should not underestimate the impact, the values, the attitudes, the skills, the knowledge of people have that we promote in our schools. Technology and uh, virus can fundamentally disrupt our social and economic structures, but the implications are never predetermined. The important thing, it's always the nature of our collective responses to those disruptions that are going to determine their outcomes. What we mobilize in response, and this is where ESD is so fundamental. Mission 4.7 sort of hits the nail, really. The SDGs offer the answer to this. Now, they are sort of the missing piece of the globalization puzzle. They are the glue that hold together the centrifugal forces in this age of accelerations. But again, it's going to be educators who hold the key to what extent the SDGs become a real contract between you know, citizens. And that's really, I think, where the promise of ESD lies. Now, the one thing that I think we all figured out, and Monica, you asked the question of, you know, do we need to fundamentally rethink education? Clearly, education is no longer about teaching students something. It's about helping them develop a reliable compass and the tools to navigate through this you know, volatile, complex, increasingly you know, ambiguous world. Now, Success in schooling today is about building curiosity, no? opening minds. It's about building compassion, opening hearts. And it's about courage. You know? Can we mobilize our cognitive, social, and emotional resources to actually take action? No? And I think these are also going to be our biggest bets against the biggest threats of our times. No? The ignorance, the closed mind, uh, hate, the closed heart and you know, fear the enemy of, of agency. Now, we simply live in this world in which the kind of things that are easy to teach, maybe easy to test, have also become easy to digitize. 
to automate. They are evaporating from our labor markets. Now we know how to educate second class robots. You know, people who are very good at repeating what we tell them. Actually in the age of artificial intelligence, we need to think a lot harder about what it means to be human. Education, the society around us is that product of education. I'm not saying you know, that state of the art knowledge is not gonna remain important, but the world no longer rewards us just for what we know. Now Google knows everything. It rewards us for what we can do and what we do with what we know. Now, science isn't just about you know, physics and chemistry, it's about, you know, can you think like a scientist? Can you use the tools of science to understand and change the world? No. History is not just about you know, remembering names and dates. It's about, can you think like an historian? No. Do you understand how the narrative of a society has emerged, how it developed, how it advanced, and sometimes how it unravels and the context changed? What does it mean for today's world? No. Schools are very good at breaking down big problems into small bits and pieces and then training students how to solve those pieces. Now, but the world today creates value by synthesizing those different pieces, now, basically to make connections between ideas that usually seem unrelated. Now, by connecting the dots where the next big idea and innovation is gonna come from. And exactly that requires being familiar with, you know, and also, receptive to the knowledge of other fields, to be able to think across the boundaries of school subjects, you know, to bring people together. And that brings me to the next topic. In today's schools, you know, we are very, very good at teaching students to learn individually. And at the end of the school year, you know, we certify the individual achievements. But and the more interdependent the world becomes, the more we need to think about, you know, great collaborators, great orchestrators, people who, understand how other people think and work, whether as a scientist or as an artist, how other people live in different cultures and different traditions. People who can live with themselves, who can live with others, who can live with the planet. In our latest PISA assessment, we looked at this in what we call global competency. And it was sobering to see how limited, you know, our education is preparing people for this. In the past, schools were, you know, technological islands with technology usually conserving existing educational practice rather than transforming it. And in the future, need to, schools need to be so much better to use technology to liberate learning from past conventions and to connect learners and learning in much more powerful ways. And again, I think this crisis has shown what is possible in this field. It has moved those kinds of ideas from the margins to the center. And finally, you know, the past was divided. You know, you had teachers and content divided by subjects and students separated by expectations about their futures now that we project very early on into their lives. Schools are very good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. Often we see a lack of engagement of families, the reluctance of teachers to look outwards to the next school, of schools to look out to the next country. The future needs to be a lot more connected, a lot more integrated. Schools is not you know, a public service, a public policy product. It's only going to succeed if it's a whole of society project. And I think that's what we see here in this panel. Thank you. I always love to listen to you. You are inspirational. And indeed, the latest OECD study on the global competencies is eye-opening. So I recommend to everyone, maybe someone can post a link to it um, in our chat. Um, it, it does shed a light on where we stand. And as you pointed out correctly, partly it's sobering. So we need lots more curiosity, compassion, courage that is taught. Whenever you speak, I really do think we all rethink schools. All right, without much further ado, the next panelist that we have is someone very special, uh, Dr. Siva Kumari. She is the Director General of the International Baccalaureate, and she is the first woman to serve in this post. She also obviously leads the overall strategic direction of IB worldwide and has decades of experience in education. So it's my real pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Siva Kumari. Thank you, Monica. Um, and it's been such an interesting dialogue. It's great to hear Sam and Andreas. Um, thank you for in inviting me to this important uh, Mission 4.7 dialogue. 
I want to talk about two topics that you uh, put forward to us, Monica. One is, do we need to rethink education? And the second is, how can SDGs be embedded uh, in teaching and learning? So we at the IB have just completed a week-long uh, global conference with the theme, Reimagine the Future, with about 4,500 educators around the world. I can tell you that educators are always ready when given the tools and when given the chance to talk about this topic and engage in it and implement it. So like you, we believe that constantly rethinking education is a perennial requirement. It's been our core value for 52 years as we consistently reinvent and co-create with our teachers worldwide for our teachers worldwide. I think we can all agree that the pandemic has put teaching, learning, and schooling front and center for children of all ages. Parents have had to become teacher aides or even teachers. Children have learned without the constraints of schools. Known routines have to, have to be reinvented. And we've seen, unfortunately, that the financial divide and how it starkly manifests itself in the educational attainment of children. A problem, unfortunately, that will be with us for a very long time. So I ask the question, if not now, when will the global community give education first priority? If not now, when? Um, so the other question is, reimagining the future is not just necessary as a reaction to upturned circumstances. It is essential in existential terms. We need to think of all that worked during this unprecedented time. What do we want to keep? What did we as a world learn together in education? What didn't work? Where is the human touch irreplaceable? Where can we effectively and purposefully supplement with technology? And as we return to the post COVID, returning to business as usual will be a waste of this global crisis. So if not now, when will we realize that we need to go beyond rhetoric to create meaningful, and sustainable systemic change in the education industry, the important industry that humans have to safeguard humanity. And Monica, I agree with you that this is a problem about humanity. The IB can contribute based on its experience in vastly diverse schools across the world. We can state without a doubt that global citizenship is a demonstrable reality and it is embraced by teachers, students, and parents that students of all ages in all types of schools can be educated to care for the world's most pressing problems while achieving their own academic requirements. The IB explicitly, speaking of it now, switching to SDGs and how they can be embedded in curriculum, the IB explicitly and proudly includes the aims of the SDGs into our curriculum. For example, sustainability. It's a central concept for our environmental systems and societies course. In our IB economics course, SDGs are addressed by investigating why is economic development uneven around the world? In our business management course, students consider the impact of the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. In design technology course, we dedicate 25% of the course syllabus to sustainability, addressing sustainable development, sustainable consumption, sustainable design, and sustainable innovation. In our service requirement course, students and schools embrace SDGs, and we have countless examples. And Sam and his colleague talked about the examples that we provided in 2018 through a large project we did with global schools. This is how one educational system can systemically and systematically educate our young about these important issues. So if we in the IB can do this, I believe that others undoubtedly can do so too. We opened our recent conference by showcasing young people, ages between 14 and 17, who have created amazing projects to address SDGs. From aquaphonics to address hunger, to career opportunities for autistic children in Bangladesh, to creating an app to educate for CPR, to food storage, to educating their communities about the inequalities they see, and so many more. These are young people who during this pandemic have remained active and engaged with their communities, tackling local and global problems 
devising solutions individually or in teams or collectively with their community while sharing their thinking with the world of peers who can be inspired and improve on these solutions within their own communities. This is what education has the power to do. We look forward to contributing our experience to this group, to SDSN and to global schools as you think about these issues deeply. And we look forward to serving alongside you in addressing this important cause. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have IB represented by you. It is an honor to have you with us today, really. Let me turn the floor to our next speaker, Professor Mustafa Öztürk. He's a professor at the Hacettepe University in Ankara, Turkey, and an awarded scholar. He is currently uh, engaged in designing, implementing, and evaluating ESD training programs, particularly for teachers, pre-service and in-service in Turkey. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Monica. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for all the people listening to us uh, around the world. I will try to summarize what we have done so far about Global Schools program in Turkey and what we are planning to do further. So we started our journey just after the sixth Vatican Youth Symposium with two questions in mind. How do global perspectives of sustainable development and global citizenship education find a way into the local education policies in Turkey, number one? And Secondly, how well does Turkish national curriculum prepare generations for global citizenship and sustainable future? To answer these two questions, we perform two types of situation analysis. A policy analysis on five key educational policy documents with respect to the basic concepts and competencies for sustainability, and a curriculum analysis on 23 subject-specific and one skill-based K-12 curriculum documents with respect to the specific learning objectives of ESD as suggested by UN and UNESCO. We have had three different teams in this process. The national research team consisting of six experts who are leading all research activities. The advisory committee consisting of 22 members who are academicians, educational experts, ministry officials, NGO representatives, school counselors, school principals, and of course, teachers. And thirdly, we had the executive committee members consisting of 32 teachers. We have so uh, a long uh, report about the results, but I would like to briefly summarize what we have found. The findings from the policy analysis revealed that the concepts of sustainable development and the 21st century skills seem to have more places in the policy documents whereas global citizenship as a concept does not get enough significance in the same documents. As a second point, most of the key competencies suggested by UNESCO are significantly reflected in Turkish educational policies, even though they are mostly implicit. Regarding the curriculum analysis, the top three SDGs that receive the highest number of references from the national learning outcomes are SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being, which is highly critical nowadays, as you can imagine, and SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. The overall findings reveal that both national curriculum and educational policies reflect an adequate level of emphasis on ESD and GCE, even though most of the emphasis happens to be implicit and changes across different subjects, as well as different educational levels. As the second step, we worked on the lesson plans suggested by Global Schools Program and decided whether they fit in the national curriculum and conform with the general educational goals of the Ministry of National Education. Those 32 teachers in the executive committee carried out the evaluations and reviews on all those six lesson plans and provided the initial feedback on documents. In the meantime, we constructed a network of ESD leader teachers who were certified about education for sustainable development and now ready to implement those lesson plans in their classrooms. Now, what's next? In fact, we had planned to pilot all those plans 
months ago across the country at different educational levels in diverse educational settings. However, as you might guess, the pandemic blocked our ways and slowed down the whole process, unfortunately. Because of the lockdown all over the country, we were not able to progress in the piloting process. When the pandemic allows us to do so, we would like to implement those lesson plans in real classrooms and get the feedback from teachers and students. Before finishing, I would like to share another important step for me personally and for the field academically. I am in the process of editing a forthcoming publication entitled Educational Response, Inclusion and Empowerment for SDGs. How do education systems contribute to raise global citizens? This book, is going, this book is going to be published by Springer, and I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to submit your work for consideration in this publication. If you have further questions and concerns, please do not hesitate to contact me. I would like to finish my words with uh, very similar ideas to the previous panelists. I would like to say that the basic way to equip the current generation and future generations with the awareness, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors required for the vision of sustainability is possible with an interdisciplinary and project-based educational approach that emphasizes research, cooperation, and creativity. So this transformation could only be realized by activating systemic, continuous, innovative, adaptable, and transformative learning methods in all processes of education, including analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. So we need to include not only students, teachers, curriculum policies, as well as all social circle around the kid and the parents in this process. Thank you very much for your listening. Wonderful. It's For me, it's always so encouraging to hear examples from the ground where things have really progressed well and they can serve as an example for many others. So I do hope that other countries will follow suit and will venture into similar processes. Thanks a lot. Let us listen to one more very detailed example, hopefully, by Professor Abdul Karim Mazouk. He's the director of the Executive Education Center at al Akhawai University, Ifran in Morocco. He is actually a geospatial expert and he lectures and researches in the fields of geography, environmental management and geographic information systems and remote sensing. So we are very curious to hear your remarks. Professor Marzouk, you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monica. Uh, excellence and distinguished uh, audience. I am really delighted to talk about the project on and pilot project about the global school, uh, which is uh, launched in Morocco and uh, taken care uh, by uh, Moroccan team. So before I start, I will just give the floor. I will take this opportunity also, since my colleague, my previous colleague, already talked about the methodology. So we'll take maybe one minute to just to put this in context in terms of uh, who was behind this in terms locally here in Morocco. So you have already introduced the Foundation Mohammed VI for environment protection, which is, was established in 2001 uh, under uh, His Majesty King Mohammed VI. And then with the effective presidency by Her Royal uh, Highness Princess Lalla, Lalla Hasna. So, and the foundation, of course, uh, you know, its main mission is education. And we're very happy to have this in Morocco and awareness on environmental issue and sustainable development. So, and it's open to public and it's for uh, you know children, school children, politicians, economic and decision makers, and the global uh, public. Uh, on its using its uh, academic arm, if you want, we have the uh, the Hassan II International Center for Environment and Training, which is also the the academic arm of the Foundation Mohammed VI, which has mainly four interconnected missions. That's one is relying on the knowledge and the experience developed around the challenges of sustainable development by relevant stakeholders, raising awareness and training actors and decision makers on major environmental and sustainable development issues, and then ensuring the synergies, sharing and communicating with foundations, partners, and large communities. And also the last uh, four interconnected mission is capitalizing and valorizing the lessons learned 
from different programs carried by the uh, foundation and its, its pedagogy and its resources. So on the uh, and then the, we're very happy to have those two uh, elements, which the main uh, in, you know national institution that helps in this. So to get to our Moroccan uh, project, uh, you know, uh, pilot, we're happy that the letter of intention was signed in April 2020 uh, between the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environment Protection and the UN Sustainable Development uh, Solution Network. And we started this uh, project based and then we have uh, gathered four main players. So we have the Hassan uh, International Center for uh, Environmental Training, the ministry, which is uh, you know, a major player of national education, vocational training, higher education and scientific research. And then we have two uh, major institutions, higher education institution, which is Akhawin University in Ifran, which is a liberal art, uh, you know, a university model following the American uh, model. And then we have the National School of Mines in, in, in Rabat. These are the main uh, player. So the project basically we were hoping that, uh, and that's what we're working on, is basically to mapping the SDGs in the K-12 education. That's the main uh, element in this. So, and then later we will propose a course as a model where we will map and then produce what is missing in our, cur uh, our uh, curriculum K-12 using the SDGs. And then later on, which is the third step, is to test the model and upscale the model. So uh, basically the principal indicator while working in the project without going into uh, much details, I think you have received the report, is that the Moroccan uh, pilot project, we used six uh, regional and national, we used six national and regional workshops a group of representatives from different actors, from the Minister of Education, teachers, insp educational inspectors. We have about 30. We have 20 multidisciplinary members of the national committee. And then we looked and we mapped a huge project of about 284 books from the Moroccan curriculum. It's all the Moroccan curriculum from K-12, third year to the baccalaureate, which is a huge number of books that we looked at using the three levels in the uh, you know, American uh, you know, K-12, the primary, the middle school, and the high school uh, together. So we, as, other, as our other colleagues in, in other uh, you know, uh, countries, we looked at two aspects. One is the policy analysis, and one is the curriculum analysis. So on the policy analysis, we looked at four Moroccan policy and legal documents. The first one is the uh, MOU charter, the second is the strategic vision, the framework law, and then the legislative outcome. On the, uh, as well as we looked at UNESCO publication on education for sustainable uh, development goals, learning objectives. And then we looked also at the SNN worksheet for mapping the exercise, which was kind of a shared document in terms of its uh, methodology. On the curriculum, of course, we looked at the curriculum and all the scientific and non-scientific uh, subjects. So, uh, and then the main conclusion that I would like to share with you are first is that uh, Morocco initiated the analysis of its school curriculum as part of a macro study of policies and curriculum. That's UNESCO 2019, based on UNESCO's work on global citizenship education and educating for sustainable development. Morocco, as you know, has, uh, is a single national uses a single national uh, curriculum, and the analysis covered all Moroccan schools and educational texts for mapping the presence of education for sustainable development, 21st century, and the education for global citizenship. The Moroccan education curriculum does include content does include content and language that further the country's global citizenship education. 21st century skills and sustainable development commitment. The analysis, the, fi the, uh, the fifth uh, conclusion is that the analysis of the four documents relates to policy and the analysis of the curriculum in its K-12 levels clearly reinforced and stated the following. So the first element is that generalizing and promoting quality education. The second one is the gender equality and then decent work and economic growth and reduced inequality without going into the details of the percentage on which it was covered, but that's the general uh, analysis uh, finding. 
So the, the sixth uh, conclusion is that the presence of variation in the reference to SDGs depending on the discipline. So there was some variation, of course, between levels, between the three levels, and the emphasis on one of the SDGs. Overall, but overall, the Moroccan curriculum shows a significant presence of SDGs at all levels. But the question now is how this program is taught and how students learn the concept and how instructor help students and adapt the concept to the reality of Morocco. This is very important because we're not just looking at the curriculum in itself, but later on we should about the receiving, which is the student and the mediation, which is basically the faculty member. So the pilot project was important considering the, in, uh, the integration of sustainable development objectives in the first four years of the primary and the middle schools and announced by the Moroccan Ministry of Education in July, 2020 in the new primary school curriculum for the start of the school year 2021. So we have reached the level when we have the, uh, when we have developed the lessons and then now is that we will move on uh, the action plan for the remaining phase, which is the three basic phase, which is one, the, the remaining phase is the test of and evaluation. So we need to test those uh, lessons that we have developed and with COVID-19, we have our under restrictions, but I think soon we will move in, we will have our uh, next meeting is just tomorrow to look at how we will test and then we uh, will evaluate, get feedback from educator. The uh, phase seven is the implementation on the roadmap. So we need to consolidate the results. And then with the Minister of National Education, Professional Training and Higher Education and establish a roadmap for the scaling up and, and full uh, implementation of Education 2030. So the last phase will just be, be the final report and toolkit that it's kind of collaborative work where we'll comply, we'll compile, sorry, all the research results of the three pilot project and then designed for comprehensive tool kit for the benefit of our school and also to implement for education 2030. Uh, and then before I finish, I would like also in parallel to this project, we have also developed the Al-Akhawin University, uh, uh, you know, a competition, what we call the short story competition on SDGs. And we have launched this uh, this year. And then we have about seven short stories selected as the best one by, uh, you know, high school students who have wrote, you know, uh, short stories and they will be uh, based on all SDGs, on the 17 SDGs, and they will be published by, uh, by AOI. They are being finalized, but we will just, uh, you know, uh, maybe in the next two weeks, they will be available and then I can share them with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a very comprehensive insight into the into the policy revisions that had to be undertaken and still are in the process of being undertaken in Morocco. And it's interesting because we, if we transfer this knowledge to other countries, much of what you have achieved already will be very interesting testing cases. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have had a very active discussion in the chat and I just want to highlight some of the points before I turn questions to, to our panelists. So there was a remark by uh, that UNESCO associated schools should probably partner with Mission 4.7, well noted. We have the presence of world's largest lesson. We're very happy that Alison Bellwood has joined us and gave us an insight in the world's largest lesson. We, has, we have also seen that um, someone was, was very validly saying, why don't we also focus on the earliest years, the earliest years for, of education where we really are laying the foundations that we eventually will build on with cognitive and behavioral knowledge so that's an interesting one, we might come back to it. And then one theme that came occasionally was the digital access and learning and technology and its increased importance. And I think that several panelists will actually have an opinion on that one. Um, so we see that technology has impacted a lot and particularly during the pandemic has become crucial. So ladies and gentlemen, we have seen a point of view from global schools. We have seen a point of view from the OECD that definitely with PISA and other assessments has really got a vested insight into where we stand, the status quo, but also where we should go. We have heard from IB, very inspirational, how leaders can be educated. And we have heard test cases from Morocco and Turkey. So 
let me point the following questions to the following speakers. It's now tough for the first one because he has to answer immediately. The others can think about their questions. So the first question that I picked up is for Andreas Schleicher, because I would like to know from your vantage point, how much will technology impact the education of the future? How much is technology crucial for implementing what the OECD has already recognized as necessity? I will ask a second question. I give you time to prepare. Sam, to you, on the theory of change of Mission 4.7. Another participant was asking for the theory of change of Mission 4.7. Another theme that came up was the involvement of youth in policy making. And I'm wondering if I have any volunteer from our case studies to tell us and illustrate how youth was involved, be it in Turkey, be it in Morocco. And then, of course, I have a last question for Sivo Kumari, if time allows. IB has managed to create incredible leaders. Many of the world's leaders are actually IB educated. What are the key ingredients to make that possible? I encourage everyone to answer in one minute. Is that possible? I do hope. So Andreas Schleicher, the floor is yours with the question on the impact of technology. Sorry, uh, technology has enormous potential uh, to trans fundamentally transform uh, learning environments. You know, artificial intelligence can make learning so much more interactive, so much more you know adaptive to the individual kind of learner preferences. You can use big data and uh, you know uh, learning analytics to give teachers so much better information on how different students learn differently. That's the potential. At the very same time, we I think the crisis has also taught us that learning is not a transactional business it's a social it's a relational phenomenon you know the one thing that students are going to remember 10 years from now from this crisis is who was the teacher who looked out for them who understood their dreams and passion who was there you know when they needed help and support you know technology is going to amplify great teaching but it's not going to replace poor teaching and the kind of transactional model. So I think, yeah, I think it will. I also think, you know, at the moment, a good education is such a scarce good. And we are not going to extrapolate from what we have, you know, to serve the world. I think there will be big bottlenecks. And I think technology can help us overcome them, spread better practice, make education learning more accessible. But I do think, you know, we should not, you know, give up what is the core, the heart of education. That's where my concerns are that, you know, we again, you know, if we focus on educating second class robots, you know, by just, you know, focusing on that kind of, that's sort of my only caveat. But yes, I see the potential. Wonderful. Very much to the point. Sam, let me turn the floor immediately to you. The theory of change for Mission 4.7. What's your take on this one? Yeah, so... I think just actually also reflecting on what Andreas said, uh, mm. the role of teachers, being able to support teachers and being able to uh, really give them the, the tools and resources so that they can <clears throat> actually uh, do this effectively. And we all know how important they are. I, I remember my very first teachers from Mr. Akbari and Mr. Nazari and, and uh, Zarmin, Mr. Armina all the way now. And they, they have had a profound impact on, on, on the, and the motivation for, for this kind of work. And it kind of went back to a lot of discussions that uh, um, I had and uh, a number of other colleagues had with uh, some of the people, in fact, who are in attendance here to explore what are the gaps? Um, how can we better prepare children for the future? And, and, and where are really the, the, the missing pieces? And how can these missing pieces be brought together? And uh, of course, it very clearly was, was uh, you know, it occurred to me that it's not possible to do it with one organization or one initiative alone. And that a, a space is really needed where different types of organizations can work together. They can uh, learn from each other's expertise, uh, you know, learning from the incredible uh, expertise of the um, OECD and the wonderful ideas that have just been mentioned in their piece of work uh, from the the incredible education that the IB is providing and the key ingredients for creating world leaders, many of whom are, uh, are also part of the uh, SDSM and global schools, uh, but really try and fill those gap as a, as a, as a collaborative uh, community on this specific issue and really put 4.7 on the map. And I think that has really come to life and there is a, there's a, a big learning curve and the theory of change will evolve as we learn more and more. But I think the excitement here is that there is now a dedicated space where together with our wonderful partners, we can accelerate and advance ESD around the world. 
Wonderful. We have received a glimpse into the theory of change. There were lots of questions about youth involvement. So I do want to ask who volunteers uh, to comment on youth involvement in policy making. Many claim it's just can a tokenization. Yeah, someone of the can panelists. Can I interrupt? Please, please yeah. go ahead. Keep it succinct because we only have six minutes left. So yeah, a one I minute answer. Very brief. So how, uh, how youth are involved in policy making. Uh, I will just give you an example, a concrete example from Al Akhwain University where we have a club uh, called the Moroccan Political Club. And this is the young leaders at the university level. They have met, you know that Morocco uh, lately, if, uh, you know, for those of you who are following the development in Morocco is uh, under uh, the leadership of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI has appointed a committee that they're working on the new model, new model of development. And that committee was appointed by King Mohammed VI and they came to IUI and they met with this young leader, which is the political economic, the, the Moroccan political club. And they have debated the issues that have to do with, with the young and how their voice should be heard. So that's the highest, if you want, that's the highest representativity in terms how, how youth have been involved from that single aspect where they're given the floor to speak and to think in two days about presenting what they think a new model of, of, of development should be for Morocco. They have invited experts and they have done workshop and they have presented their new model of education to that committee that was appointed by the King Mohammed VI. Wonderful, good example. Maybe uh, Mustafa Öztürk, you also want to comment on youth involvement in the case of Turkey? Uh, to be honest, in, uh, in the case of Turkey, youth inform involvement is only um, common in action, okay. not in policy. Okay. Yeah, in action, I mean, we have really good youth advocates for mm -hmm. sustainability and other issues, environmental issues, other human rights, gender issues. They are really, really active uh, on uh, the, the, they have a digital lobby, let's say, Mm -hmm. And they have uh, doing this advocacy uh, a lot in Turkey, but unfortunately, in, at policy level, they are not that much represented, mm -hmm. I can say. Mm -hmm. okay. For ESG and global citizenship education, I can say that not maybe in K-12 to level, but in higher education level, in tertiary, at tertiary level, uh, Turkish uh, young people are really, really active mm -hmm. in uh, these issues. And we have youth hubs, we have, you know, SDS in Turkey, and we have um, different uh, societies in each university. So at university level, they are really doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say that. But it illustrates exactly what was mentioned, that there is a need, a dire need for more youth involvement in policymaking. Definitely. Let me turn to, like, this is my, my leadership, uh, leadership segue for Siva Kumari. Dr. Kumari, leaders are made at IB. Tell us, what are the, what are the secret ingredients? Are there any secrets? I'll do that in one minute or less, Monica. Um, the, so, so I think what we advocate for is that intellect, education, and high standards are very, very important to us and should be to the world as well. But what you do as a human you know, for, for the common good, we believe is equally important. So academic standards and engagement of the heart, as Andreas kind of put it earlier. Discovering your agency habitually from age three until 19, that you as an individual can make change. Change takes effort. It takes patience. It takes all kinds of things. And making that a part of the curriculum for us is an important seed to sow in education. And I do not think we should underestimate the power of the youth in making change. And we as educators need to support that and give it equal importance. So there's my short answer. Brilliant. We have one minute left and I would love to still do the lightning round, but I have to limit all the speakers to really one sentence. What is the one headline that you want the audience to take away from this session? And I'll start with Amanda because Amanda, you didn't have the floor another time. Amanda, please tell us your one sentence. 
Yes, I just want to say quickly that as far as the role of youth, um, you know, Global Schools started as a network of young people and it has been instrumental in pushing Mission 4.7. And SDSN Youth has also had a role in Mission 4.7, not only um, from the Secretariat, but also with the support of other youth voices and volunteers. So for my one sentence, I will say that youth engagement starts here with us at the Vatican Youth Symposium. So use this as a space to network and, and take these policy um, agendas us forward. Wonderful. Professor Oetstuk, the second sentence for you. What does the audience take away? Okay, I will talk about uh, educational point again. I will just revise, I mean, I will just repeat what I have said before. We need to activate systemic, continuous, innovative, adaptable, and transformative learning methods in education, especially in K-12 levels. Brilliant, succinct. Professor Marzouk, what is your sentence that we take away? Um, my sentence of takeaway, I would just say, if you support the SDGs, you will explore a new way of learning. Very memorable, wonderful. Then the one sentence, dear Dr. Kumari, what would it be? Um, I think there's so many goals. So pick a goal and think every day of what you're doing towards that goal. Nice, and then Sam, the not last word, but now for this session, last word to you. What is the one sentence? Yeah, uh, my one sentence is, uh, if you give young people the tools, uh, the platform, the training and the networks that they need, they will surprise you. And we've seen it over and over again at SDSN Youth and also hopefully through Global Schools. And that's exactly what we want to do, inspire the next generation of young leaders through Global Schools and then Mission 4.7. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been fascinating. I do want to thank all the speakers and panelists and the audience. We will, I think, have a short one minute break before we go to the next session, which will be chaired by Chandrika Bahadur, Director of SDG Academy and SDSN. It will be our session, the third session on education for sustainable development in tertiary and professional settings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. What a wonderful session we had, inspiring speakers and such a wealth of information. Um, Sam, are we taking a break or should we dive straight in? Perhaps 30 seconds and then we can go in. All right. May I ask all the speakers of session three to um, please uh, be ready and um, I will unmute you, but you can also unmute yourselves. All right, let us begin. Um, welcome to session three of the launch of Mission 4.7 here at the Vatican Youth Symposium. Uh, one of the most interesting things about SDG 4 is that it makes reference to lifelong learning for all. And what that means is that it recognizes uh, that not only um, is uh, education important for young people, but it's actually important for people throughout their lives and that learning does not stop when we step out of our educational institutions. Uh, so for this purpose, we have, uh, now we're now gonna shift attention to higher and continuing education and the role that it'll play in the achievement of SDG 4.7. Uh, I'm Chandrika Bahadur. I direct the SDG Academy, where we create and curate content on sustainable development. Um, I would invite all of you to look at the materials that we've created. We've had a history now of six years of not just creating the material, but working with universities uh, to have them be used as part of uh, teaching on uh, education, uh, teaching and learning for sustainable development. Um, I'm also honored to chair the Secretariat of Mission 4.7, and I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. Before we begin, a few um, housekeeping points. Please remember that this event is live on YouTube. Uh, please do keep your microphones off unless the moderators unmute them. Please try and keep your cameras on. It's lovely to see all of you, unless, of course, bandwidth issues intervene. Uh, do tell us um, your thoughts through the chat function. It's important not just for asking questions, but also to hear your comments and your thoughts, which will all help as we design uh, 4.7 when we move forward. 
Remember that there is simultaneous translation, so please pick the language of your choice from the bottom right-hand button. Uh, when you do ask your questions, um, if you have questions for the panel, uh, please specify who you want the question to go to. And please tell us where you're from. We are delighted that we have been joined by people from so many parts of the world. And please remember we are on social media. The hashtags are in the chat function. Um, I'd request the organizers to put them in again, spread the word. We need as many people as possible to join our mission. So with that, let's delve right in. We have a stellar group of speakers today. And I'm so pleased that we're kicking off with someone I personally deeply admire and respect. Um, we're delighted to welcome Ms. Irina Bukova, a two-time former Director General of UNESCO and a world leader in education. Um, Irina, uh, we're delighted you're going to be making opening remarks uh, for this session, and I give you the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chandrika, for this opportunity and my congratulations uh, to the co-organizers, uh, UNESCO, the Ban Ki-moon Center and the Pontifical Academy, the SDSN network with all of these institutions, I'm some, somehow linked and uh, it's a very rewarding uh, for me experience uh, to be here. Um, I would like to say that uh, it's so wonderful to see a concept, an idea that uh, we launched um, uh, before the Rio Plus 20 conference uh, that nowadays uh, blossomed and uh, was of course incorporated in the goal number four uh, and mission uh, 4.7. And uh, let me just say, I like very much the word mission. Uh, we, in our bureaucratic language in the United Nations, we were saying target, I think mission indeed is the right word uh, to name it uh, because this captures uh, all the meaning of why education should be at the heart of the sustainable development agenda. I would like just to make three points um, as, as an introduction. The first, uh, I believe now in the COVID-19 uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, when we have seen indeed the devastating uh, impact on education and education being both, uh, I would say, uh, at the same time, uh, a goal in itself and a means to achieve the other goals on the sustainable development agenda. We have to reconfirm our commitment to the goal number four and to look once again to revisit the targets. We know that it's an aspirational, but we really need to look at uh, the targets and how to uh, uh, implement, how to achieve them. Uh, it is important uh, because it uh, relates to everything uh, that is at stake today about the climate change, about the job opportunities, uh, about the fighting inequalities, about health, of course, uh, about gender equality, uh, and, uh, and I could uh, pass on. And of course, we have seen the uh, positive uh, impact uh, of uh, technology and of the digital. And definitely the future will be digital. The opportunities are incredible, enormous. But if we don't look at the bottlenecks, uh, at the gaps that still exist in the digital, I don't think we will give justice to uh, education as a social mobility tool, uh, as education uh, in inclusiveness, and also into the aspect of lifelong learning, something that uh, you yourself uh, uh, just, uh, just mentioned. Uh, uh, we should not forget that uh, in order to bridge these uh, inequalities, everyone has to get an access to good digital platforms, to good quality and, uh, and fast uh, broadband. And unfortunately, half of humanity does not have actually access uh, to this. Uh, on the other side, of course, we have to look at the uh, innovation and everything uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the digital uh, may bring uh, to education. And my third point, of course, which is very much uh, the, uh, now uh, the debate, it is about the tertiary education. And if I look at the uh, goal number four, uh, and uh, just a little bit of history, there are many firsts uh, in uh, uh, goal number four. Uh, it was uh, about the holistic uh, approach to education, all the levels of education, which are important. Uh, uh, we speak about tertiary, but without a very sound primary and secondary, I think there will be also problems uh, with the tertiary. Uh, there is, uh, for the first time, uh, the uh, target of financing of education, something that 
right now also needs to be very much uh, uh, reminded again uh, because uh, I have uh, uh, looked for some, some figures recently about all the packages uh, that are given for overcoming the crisis and it seems uh, only 1% of all these big packages go to education. So definitely there is a gap that needs to be bridged if we want really education to serve the goal of being at the heart of the sustainable development agenda. Now, if I go uh, specifically to the tertiary education and the lifelong learning, and I think uh, you did mention also, and I would like to commend uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, uh, that uh, has been uh, so active uh, from all this uh, last year since its inception. And I was at the very first meeting uh, in New York and I have seen the incredible uh, uh, impact uh, already going global and it has. Uh, and uh, the contribution, the last uh, uh, very important uh, publication, the guide, uh, 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 the guide that uh, you have published on accelerating education for the SDGs in, in universities is really uh, something, a very important publication that I would strongly recommend to, to everybody uh, to take on board. It speaks about uh, uh, how to support students and learners uh, uh, and how to develop the necessary skills, the knowledge and the mindset, something that uh, we discussed uh, here today. Uh, I would like to say that um, uh, when we speak about the higher education, uh, I would also wait here science because higher education and science are very closely linked and they're really the real drivers of, uh, of uh, transformation. I think uh, it is uh, very important also to mention that uh, the complexity of our world needs indeed a different approach of universities. It's the, this kind of intersectorial approach this is the bridge between the natural, the social sciences, uh, uh, because if we speak nowadays, uh, and many speaks about uh, the fusion of technologies that are blurring the lines between the physical, the digital, the biological sphere, there indeed is an increasing need for higher education to search for these responses, both from the point of view of their positive economic, uh, social and environmental uh, impact, but I would like to say also of the human impact because the, all the uh, successful uh, education strategies uh, uh, nowadays, uh, I think should uh, include in a very equal measure, the deep consideration of the human, the ways in which this technology is shifting um, uh, economic power impacts people in all the different uh, uh, levels and the threats indeed that exists within a world that is interconnected and uh, uh, is uh, somewhat, as we say, uh, under pressure. And this is once again, where I believe uh, education for sustainable development, education for global citizenship uh, uh, comes uh, uh, into the picture. And, and something uh, that uh, when we were adopting and formulating goal number four, we were thinking something is missing. If agenda 2030, is for the people, about the people, leaving no one behind. In all this diversity, humanity, we really have to embrace this and to put this strong notion about intercultural competencies, about empathy, about solidarity, about understanding the others. Something that nowadays in the post COVID world will be probably some of the most important lessons to learn about all of us. And, and I'm finished uh, with this, I would really strongly um, like to congratulate uh, His Holiness, uh, Pope Francis, uh, for his last encyclica, Tutti Fratelli. Uh, I, I remember because I'm also a member of a high committee on human fraternity that His Holiness created with the grand imam of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo when they signed two years ago a historic document on human fraternity. And I think this is the way to implement further on the right approach, the right mindset in order to embrace values that are critical for all of us. And thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you, Irina. What a wonderful way to start us off. And uh, thank you for outlining uh, you know, some of the themes that we will come back to in this session, particularly around the issue of access to technology and uh, intersectorality of, the, of, of education at the higher education level, uh, but also the values, um, the global values that we uh, would like uh, 
to see young people imbibe in the role that universities have to play. Uh, let me ask you just one question before uh, we get onto the panel. Um, and that in, in your work, uh, what are some of the best examples that you have seen of um, institutions of higher education actually promoting uh, global citizenship and values of uh, sustainable development? Well, you know, there are many, many institutions and you can imagine I have uh, traveled and talked to uh, many ministers and I'm, I'm very happy that, of course, UNESCO now continues uh, in the continuity, uh, this very strong uh, uh, drive and leadership uh, uh, in this area. I think it's wonderful because this, this is what UNESCO contributes uh, to the world. Um, I would uh, like to come back to uh, what uh, the um, former Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and uh, I'm sitting also on the board of the Ban Ki-moon Center, and we worked with him uh, already in uh, 2012, uh, 2013, uh, for the Global Education First Initiative. And I would mention that the Republic of Korea is one of the champions, has been our many debates and discussions, actually, uh, the goal number four was adopted in Incheon in the major conference um, in 2015. Uh, and before that, it was preceded by many brainstorming and discussions on the global education. And it was once again uh, Korea that was the champion of this, with, of course, uh, the then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. But I think it was embraced by the uh, Korean society. And nowadays, many universities have integrated it in their programs. Uh, there is under the auspices of UNESCO an Asia Pacific Center uh, for uh, an education for international understanding that prepares curricular for global citizenship education. There is a, a wonderful uh, institute, Mahatma Gandhi Institute in Delhi, uh, also uh, that uh, we created during, during my tenure and I have visited uh, uh, many times. They are working strongly once again in this concept of, uh, of global citizen, how we embrace uh, all these values. So, uh, and of course, I would say, and I congratulate you with the Academy. I think uh, the SDSN is doing marvelous work nowadays all over the world. And uh, it is so rewarding to see that it really starts to be embedded uh, in higher education, in education systems. Congratulations indeed. Thank you, Irina. Thank you so much. Uh, let us now uh, turn to our wonderful panel. Um, We're going to organize this session a little bit differently. Um, so what we'll do is I'll introduce you to the panel and then we'll, um, we'll pose questions uh, which where we'll uh, invite responses from the panelists and move across uh, three broad themes uh, which I'll introduce in just a moment. So first let me um, introduce you to our panel. We are joined by Teresa Young, uh, dynamic youth leader. She's project lead of SDS and youth and a recent graduate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Welcome, Teresa. We okay. also have uh, Noha Al Khalki, program director of the Millennium Campus Network, a group that many of you are familiar with that's working to promote sustainable development on university campuses. Um, we're very honored to be joined by Professor Fernando Rimas, who really doesn't need much of an introduction. He's the Ford Foundation Professor of Practice in International Education and Director of the Global Education Initiative, Initi Innovation Initiative, I beg your pardon, and of the International Education Policy Program at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Uh, Akpezi Ogbigwe, who's the director of Rivers State University of Science and Technology Advancement in Nigeria. She's also served as head of environmental education and training of the United Nations Environment and was UNEP's lead focal point for the UN Decade of Education for Sustainable Development. So there's a lot of wisdom that she has to share with us. Um, we also have Professor Jose Maria del Corral, who is the president of the foundation Scolas Ocurrentes. He has spent 20 years as working as the president of the Education Council of the Archdiocese of Buenos Aires, um, and we're delighted to have him here. Uh, this is our wonderful panel, and then we will have a closing statement by Professor Stefano Zamagni, who is professor of economics at the University of Bologna. So thank you very much to the panel for being here. And I want to start us off by posing a question that picks up on a, a point that Irina made towards the end of her intervention. 
um, which is that through our university systems, are we really preparing young adults in values of global citizenship? If we are, what are the examples of the success? And if we are not, where do we see the greatest challenges? And a related question to that is that, what are these values uh, that you see uh, as important? And do you see universities consider these values as critical and important in their role as shapers of young adults? So maybe I will start with um, Professor Jose. Um, if you're here and if you can talk to us a little bit about the values that you see as being critical. Professor Ho, can we have him um, unmuted? Is he here? Yeah, there you are. Professor Jose Maria del Coral, the floor is yours. Sí, bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias. Eh, para mí es un placer poder compartir con tantos jóvenes de lugares tan diversos, de historias tan diversas. Muchas gracias también, querido Jeffrey, Estefano y mi muy estimado Monseñor Marcelo Sánchez Orondo y a todo el equipo de la Academia de Ciencias, que tanto viene haciendo durante tanto tiempo por hacer realidad y convertir estas palabras en gestos concretos. También, por supuesto, a Estefania y a todo el equipo de UNESCO, y a todos mis colegas docentes. Hace un pequeño ratito veíamos al Papa Francisco hablando que el pacto educativo estaba roto. ¿Saben qué? Lo dijo en 1997 también. Hay un programa en Argentina que dice más vale tarde que nunca. Por eso celebro que estemos hoy aquí. Después de 27 años. El pacto educativo, como lo dice el Papa, no está roto por el COVID. El COVID mostró nuestra realidad. Vimos la salud pública rota y la falta de políticas públicas, pero no vimos las escuelas rotas. No vimos los bancos rotos, el currículum roto, la formación docente rota. Lo que lidiamos los docentes que tenemos pasión y vocación a pesar del sistema educativo implantado. ¿Quiénes son los que se asfixian? los jóvenes. Es más, decimos son el futuro. ¿Por qué? Porque no existen. Justamente por eso decimos que son el futuro. Porque si creemos en los jóvenes, diríamos, como hoy dice el Papa, que son el presente. Porque el futuro no existe. Tenemos el aquí y el ahora. O están acá y están ahora, o no están. En Argentina decimos hay que sacarse la careta. Y el Papa nos convocó en 1997 a rehacer ese pacto educativo, como lo ha dicho Monseñor Sáñez hace poquito en la Congregación por Educación Católica. En ese momento no se llamaba Escuelas Ocurrentes, este grupo revolucionario. Se llamaba Escuela de Vecinos, un nombre viejo, poco atractivo tal vez. Pero ¿qué hacíamos? Juntábamos colegios públicos y privados de distintos barrios de la ciudad de Buenos Aires y luego del país para que los chicos armaran un aula sin paredes. Porque metíamos a los chicos en cuatro paredes y cuanto más parecidos sean, mejor. Hasta le poníamos un uniforme en particular, uno con corbata verde, otro con polleras grises, eran re católicos, o re de cada religión, o re públicos, pero nunca se encontraban. Y decíamos por el otro lado que había que respetar la diversidad, que era importante que trabajaran juntos. Los llevábamos en helicóptero 
desde los barrios cerrados donde vivimos a los barrios cerrados donde estudian. Por eso Jorge Bergoglio, viendo esta realidad y la crisis que vivía mi país, Argentina, y que Monseñor Sánchez Solondo conoce bien, de hecho no se llama casualmente el corralito que revienta el sistema financiero, corralito, para que nadie se escape, ni la plata, ni la gente, ni la mente, ni el pensamiento. Dijo, vengo y necesito que ustedes recuperen el pacto educativo roto en mi país. Y por eso armamos la escuela de vecinos, para juntar chicos de diferentes niveles económicos y de diferentes religiones, haciendo una experiencia de una semana donde ellos planteaban sus problemas reales. La droga, la muerte, el suicidio, la violación, las cosas reales que le pasaban. ¿Y saben qué? No se quedaban en una simple denuncia o en palabras. Buscaban soluciones concretas. De ahí nació la ley Ciudad Educativa, 2169. De ahí nació la ley ante las adicciones. Ahí nació la ley de tallas. Porque las chicas sufrían. Porque iban a comprar ropa de moda y como tenían teóricamente unos kilos de más, no conseguían un pantalón de moda, una pollera de moda. Y eso no era una pavada. Traía muerte, enfermedad, bulimia, anorexia. Lo mismo con la ley de bullying que pudimos implementar en, en muchos países de Latinoamérica. Por eso cuando Jorge Bergoglio llega al Papa, no se lleva a un grupo de argentinos amigos, se lleva lo que él había descubierto como pastor y como líder en Argentina. Y gracias a la colaboración de la Academia de Ciencias y de Monseñor Sánchez Sorondo, no de todos, ¿eh? esta locura que nació con Bergoglio, en Buenos Aires, el 13 de agosto del 2013, a las 13 horas, se anuncia, y el Papa lo anuncia, entregando el primer olivo, que nace Escolas Ocurrentes. Unos pocos meses después, el Papa me envía a hablar con Ban Ki-moon, al cual tengo el gusto de volverlo a escuchar. Y le digo en una reunión privada, que Escolas nació ahora al mundo para que los jóvenes sean los que cambien la educación. Él se ríe y me dice, me encanta la figura del Papa, Francisco, y lo que usted me está diciendo a mí acá tiene mucho que ver con lo que yo escuché de él allá. Lo que no pensé es que no solo me lo iba a decir, sino que ya había arrancado a hacerlo. Le recuerdo sus palabras que dio Ban Ki-moon. En la primera reunión que hace Escolas en la Academia de Ciencias, el mismo año que el Papa la crea, en el 2013, no invitamos a educadores. Invitamos al señor Google, a la señora Facebook, al joven Twitter, a Globan, Oracle, todos a la Academia de Ciencias. Y le dijimos necesitamos que nos ayuden a construir un aula sin paredes. Y nos miraron con cara extraña, 2013 Academia de Ciencias. ¿Y saben qué? El primer y principal problema que salió es la falta de conectividad. Y firmamos un acuerdo para eso. Y firmamos un acuerdo con el organismo que reúne a todas las telecomunicaciones a nivel internacional para pedir conectividad como un derecho humano como si fuera el derecho al agua, que los pibes se puedan comunicar, que puedan estar conectados. Pero estoy diciéndolo muchos años antes de que llegara el COVID. Por eso yo tuve COVID y muchos han muerto del COVID. En honor a esas muertes, por favor, no sigamos esperando tantos años más para hacerlo que no sean palabras. Como dice el Papa Francisco, lo que me gusta de escolas es que es concreto. Y es más, dice algo, si no es católico, dice, si no es concreto, no es católico ni siquiera. Escolas no busca una confesión religiosa. Escolas no busca enseñar matemática, lengua, historia, geografía. 
Escolas puede ser universal siendo tan local, porque lo único que genera es que los jóvenes puedan plantear lo que realmente les pasa y que se encuentren en la diversidad, como se encontraron los jóvenes palestinos, israelíes en Jerusalén, cuando claro. hicimos la experiencia de escuelas. O cuando se encontraron los chicos de México y de Estados Unidos, a pesar del muro, que seguimos construyendo los adultos, y que gracias a Dios los jóvenes lo derriban, todos los días. Fratelli Tutti, me dijo el Papa hace pocos días cuando estuve, no se logra leyendo la encíclica, se logra cambiando la educación y la escuela que tenemos. Pero animémonos, por favor, porque seguimos construyendo, inaugurando. Y nos sacamos los problemas de encima y creemos callar así nuestra conciencia. Por eso Escolas va a asistir hasta que el pacto educativo esté implementado, hasta el último lugar del mundo y el último joven. Muchas gracias. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor. And we will come over a wonderful, inspirational example for us all. Uh, let me turn maybe now uh, to Professor Rimas, um, especially also following from uh, Professor Coral's speech, you have been uh, It's such a pleasure to be part of this convening. I think that 10, 100, 10,000, this is a challenge of 7.6 billion humans. Of those, 1.3 are students at all levels. If we could mobilize all students so that the, the, each one of them educated four adults, we would solve this problem. So how do we mobilize 1.3 billion students? Of Of them, 200 million are university students, which means if each university student engaged with 6.5 students at the pre-university level, we would solve this problem. And I think that's what universities need to do. Teach students to stop contemplating the problem and doing something about it. And that's what I've been trying to do. Let me give you an example. I've developed a methodology to engage university students in partnering with elementary schools and with non-formal education institutions in developing contextually situated curriculum about climate change. We will not solve the problem of climate change with a universal curriculum for the world because the impact of climate change is different in Guatemala, in Haiti, in Sindh, Pakistan, or in the United States. In order for a curriculum to be empowering, to empower people, to understand, mitigate, adapt, and revert climate change, it has to build the capacities that people need in those contexts. And that is a challenge that schools by themselves are unable to do. The teachers do not have the necessary knowledge to do that. In this book, I reviewed most of the existing climate change curriculum. And they're all about teaching the facts of climate change, the science of climate change. That is, as if we believe that we're going to achieve the SDGs by teaching students the meaning of each of these icons. This is the lowest possible way in a Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge that will produce no change in the world. We don't produce a world without poverty because people can regurgitate and say SDG number one is a world without poverty. We don't produce a world without poverty, even if people understand why it would be good to have a world without poverty. We produce a world without poverty we can, when we can identify what are the capacities, what is the knowledge, the dispositions, and the skills that people need, poor and non-poor alike, to build a world without poverty. And that task is a task that most of the 80 million teachers around the world by themselves cannot do. But if we can connect to universities and elementary and secondary schools, we can do this. One of the great innovations of the last five decades has been the explosion of higher education. There are 28,000 universities around the world. 
And if we could engage these universities so that university students engage with elementary and secondary schools in partnership, in developing a curriculum that makes sense for that place, not to get people to say, we should address climate change, not to get people to recognize these goals, but to identify the human capacities that people need to gain, to mitigate, adapt, and revert climate change. And this book, which I have placed on the link, is an example of how to do that. There are now several universities around the world adopting this method, which is simple. It can be scaled because it doesn't involve creating new courses. It involves getting university faculty members to integrate in their courses opportunities for their students to develop partnerships with elementary and secondary school teachers developing curriculum that works. And I think if we do that, we succeed at helping students learn the skills they need. The best way to learn something is to teach it or to partner with someone in teaching them. When my students partner with teachers developing a curriculum to help, for example, students in Guatemala learn to mitigate, adapt, and revert climate change, they truly understand what climate change is and what needs to happen to change it. They have learned it from the teachers and from the students they have served. So this is what I have done over the last several years with my students producing curriculum like this, curriculum which is now being taught in many schools around the world. This was done with a team of graduate students and it's an example of the enormous potential of students at the university level to be of service to those who are not in the university. Same thing with this curriculum. So to sum up, I think that universities are extremely cosmopolitan institutions. Of all the educational institutions we have, they are perhaps the one that best prepare people to understand the SDGs. But universities serve a very small percentage of the world population. 200 million people of the 7.6 billion humans are enrolled in universities. Even relative to students, we have 200 million university students relative to 1.3 billion students in elementary and secondary, most of whom will never go to university. So if universities are going to educate students to achieve the SDGs, the first thing they need to teach them is that this is about joining with others who are not members of the university community. That achieving the SDGs is not about contemplating the problem, is not even about educating members of the university community to understand it. It's about joining in solidarity with those who are not in the university, uneducated adults, the people who are served by non-formal education centers, the people who are served by elementary schools and secondary schools, and jointly develop curriculum that builds the capacities to teach these. And I think that for the most part, universities are doing that. Univers over the last 10 months, I have been studying how universities around the world have partnered with elementary and secondary schools to support them in sustaining educational opportunity during this global calamity of COVID. And universities, most of them already understand that the best way we educate our students to improve the world is by engaging them in the, ask of improving, in the task of improving it. Universities are doing this already. I think we just need to be a little bit more systematic in codifying what is done and in transferring very quickly simple methodologies that can be scaled. That's all I wanted to say. And I have placed on the, on the link a few resources which are open education resources, all of them developed with my graduate students. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Remus. Excellent. And you can see in the chat function, this, what you've said has resonated very deeply with, uh, with our audience here. Let me now turn to uh, Teresa Young. Teresa, you are one of the students that uh, Professor Remus is referring to, a recent graduate. Uh, you've been working both with STSN as well as working as a student. Uh, tell us a little bit from your perspective, uh, are universities really doing enough? What more can they do? And what more can young people in universities do to achieve Mission 4.7? Yes, of course. A great honor to be here with all these distinguished speakers. Um, there are a few things I'd like to share from my work at the SDG Students Program uh, about this particular issue. The first one, I think, is about how the challenge is mostly 
it's shifting the way we're looking at education, not in something that needs to be focused on the curriculum for how are we integrating sustainable de uh, development, but in supporting education beyond the campus. I want to stress this to all the people who are listening to this and also to all our different panelists that the SDGs is not something that needs to be taught and taught only. It is something that needs to be enabled and it's a way of doing. What I've seen from the entire network of students, leaders, and also enthusiastic uh, students who are hoping to make a change in the world is that if we want them to become critically needed change makers in all contexts, big and small, they have to stop becoming simply passive consumers on content, but creating interesting projects out in the world and their local communities to actually nail that in, in terms of how they are supposed to be that change maker in their local communities. I'd like to give a few different examples for how action has been supplementing uh, tertiary education in a few different universities that we're operating in, just to showcase how that part is one of the most important parts, in my opinion, for what sustainable development needs to look like in education. For example, um, when one of our one of our university hubs in Uganda, for example, very unfortunately during COVID, the COVID pandemic had one of their major administrative buildings burnt down. What they told me was in response to this, we're learning a lot about you know, fire drills and different sort of safety systems. I'm gonna go together with my hub and start designing things that are gonna be donated to the university campus to help them recover from the fire. This is what we mean when we say sustainable development is something to be taught. It's something that needs to be enabled. It's something to be done. Another thing I, I like to see, uh, I've seen in the past month is that some of our uh, fellows and also our coordinators in New Delhi have decided that after COVID, they will come together with a plan to collect the voices of children and women in slums to come up with policy suggestions for how they can better recover from the pandemic. Again, this is something that they've decided to do going beyond their campus. But this all happened because the university has become a ground for them to achieve such collaboration and also to turn that knowledge into action. It's a great way for them to meet other people who are also interested in very similar things. But that knowledge in itself for how do we uh, create safe systems or how do we collect information and do policy making, that needs to go beyond learning into translating into community. So that's the first thing I wanna say in terms of uh, the challenges in our current education system, not just on curriculum, it has to be action-based. Second thing also echoing on uh, what's been said before on a digital divide. I'm sure that a lot of participants I see here on the Zoom call might be paying for us to enter this call. And the reason for this is because a lot of the data that's necessary for them to access information and online webinars or education needs to be paid in, in a very high amount of cost in their local communities and giving the digital divide and the inconsistency of university education under COVID-19. Sustainable development needs to be something that has to be structurally supported make, to make sure that no one gets left behind during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll see this, for example, in, uh, in the case of some countries and universities offering data subsidies and reimbursements for students to and, and go into online education. But how are we translating that into more general uh, accessibility programs so that all countries and also all students who are being left behind due to the lack of infrastructure can be made sure to be part of that recovery and also keep on their learning during COVID-19. Last but not least, I think uh, I'd like to touch upon the idea of what university is for. I come from London School of Economics and uh, from the home city that I'm from in Hong Kong, career is one of the top things that students are thinking about. How exactly is sustainable development being incorporated into this core stress that they have in terms of, for example, what am I gonna do after university? I, I want to go into this hub and learn about sustainable development, but I've also got schoolwork and I think schoolwork is gonna be more important for me if I wanna get a job. How are we incorporating what we think is important for society into what society is telling them to be important? Uh, there are a few things I'd like to say. For, for example, I remember when we were recruiting a coordinator. So these are university students that are setting uh, student organizations at different universities to teach them about sustainable development. One of them told me that I am here for one reason and one reason only. That is, I see my peers dropping out of school because of unemployment at, at home. They don't have the money, therefore they're drop, dropping out of school. And I wanna make sure that what we're doing here at school, it's not just making sure that they're being fed content to go into the next stage of their life, but that it's being useful so that they can, for example, earn extra part-time jobs uh, income so that they can stay in school. 
So when we're talking about sustainable development, we need to find a way to make sure it's not something that's seen as an extracurricular to be competing with the school curriculum, but it incorporated into what's necessary in a school curriculum. Uh, in our program, we see that one thing we've done very well is uh, creating some sort of certification or proof to celebrate the, uh, their learnings and action in sustainable development. Uh, we have partnered with the Ban Ki-moon uh, Global Citizenship Center that, and also with, uh, with SDSN and also SG Academy, which Chan Jirka is working in, so that all students are going through action components and also learning about uh, sustainable development gets a certificate to prove that they've done this. Sadly, in this world, we don't have enough incentive systems for that yet. So, Looking forward, I'd be willing and happy to hear what our different panelists are thinking about this specific issue. Great, thank you, Teresa. Lots of food for thought and um, really interesting to see you uh, bring up the issue of careers because of course that is a central concern of young people. And so maybe let me turn to uh, Professor uh, Bigwe. Uh, you are leading a, a formal educational institution can you describe a little bit about how uh, you're addressing sustainable development, particularly in the context of the kind of concerns that Teresa has raised? The floor is yours. You're on mute. So let me. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. perfectly. Thank you very much, Chandruka. And I would like to say um, thank you to uh, the organizers. Uh, now, in my institution, what we have been doing, we have seen that um, just designing or developing special courses do not really solve the problem. Because when you des they design a, spe a special specific program, for instance, on um, good citizenship, and it stands alone, the students would later on have the problem of applying it to their courses and applying it when they get to the real world. So the best method that I have used and that I have seen that works is when integration is seen as a reflection of the content of what the teachers must teach and the pedagogy they implement. So being a good citizen, a global citizen, being a, a person of value, being a person who cares about others, who empathizes with others, should not be distinct from what the teacher is teaching. It should be included in the particular course and in the way the teacher is teaching that particular course. So it is not about um, introducing new curriculum but it is about reflecting these global values of respect for nature, of universal human rights, of economic justice, and a culture of peace in the various disciplines and also in the schools. And I know that what this then means, the challenge that we have is that, that we find that the teacher or the lecturer, as, as in the case with university, plays a very critical role is he prepared for this approach to studying? Is he prepared to revise, you know, uh, his um, or her curriculum, you know, with this in mind? So it is critical also for the lecturer and the teachers to be exposed to continuous professional education, continuous discourse on this um, on this issue. Uh, just like um, I think it was Fridjof Capra who counseled that academics must care not just about the next graduation, but about the next generation. So it's not just about um, graduating doctors and uh, scientists, you know, like we saw during the COVID. We saw scientists, we saw science in action, technology in action without equity. We still saw poverty, we still saw. Uh, things that should not be there. We didn't see empathy in, in some cases, but then we need to groom scientists with a heart. We need to groom technologists, you know, with empathy, with, with the knowledge of equity, with who can be fair in the way they practice their, their disciplines. So I think we are living in unique times that demand unique contributions from unique teachers. Thank you. 
Wonderful. And what a great message uh, to, uh, to end the panel discussion on. Um, I'm going to uh, do a quick uh, review of the questions. As you can see, the chat box has been extremely, extremely active. Um, I think uh, there are a couple of uh, things that have come out. Uh, one is um, uh, the question of uh, coming in from uh, Kazakhstan asking about how, uh, how what measures can we take, especially after COVID-19, to promote sustainable development goals through education. So that's one, and I know several of the speakers have touched on it, uh, but just for you to consider when we do closing statements. Um, and then the second question that came with, uh, uh, that I wanted to highlight was the role of um, uh, conflict and the role of uh, trying to achieve the SDGs through a focus on peace building. And again, the role that universities can play in that. Um, and then there was a question around uh, diversity, which is I think more a question to the organizers here of diversity in uh, mission 4.7 in terms of reflecting uh, individuals from different groups that to get a different uh, viewpoint and experience into uh, the deliberations that we have here. Uh, so with that, let me just uh, ask uh, for each of you, and uh, sorry, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry, we still have one speaker. I'm so sorry, Noha, I completely, um, I had you on my list. I do have a question for you. So let's turn to Noha first. Um, Noha, you are working with young people around uh, universities around the world. Based on what Teresa has said and based on what some of the other panelists has, have said, what is your perspective on what young people uh, should be doing or what they need or what they're asking for in terms of sustainable development? The floor is yours. Sure, thank you so much and, and Norris. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be here with you today at the Vatican Youth Symposium. Um, I just wanna start by uh, one, thanking Dr. Jeffrey Sachs for inviting me and also to thank everybody at SDSN and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences for bringing us all together to uh, learn and reflect from each other um, uh, thank you for all of the amazing panelists and for the insight that you've shared. Um, so yes, my name is Noha. I serve as the programs director at Millennium Campus Network, MCN. Uh, we're a global nonprofit based in Boston um, that work to support undergraduate student leaders um, own their power for social impact on campus and their communities. Um, and since we've been around, um, we've supported over 8,000 other undergraduate student leaders committed to social impact from over 400 universities around the globe. Um, we do this through our signature program, the Millennium Fellowship, which is presented in partnership with the United Nations Academic Impact. And through that, we've made it our mission to support students in creating a platform where they can learn about the various ways they can advance the sustainable development goals and learn about social impact. Um, the fellows receive trainings, connections, and credentials as they work on a specific and a concrete initiative that advances at least one of the SDGs. Um, this creates an experiential learning opportunity for them throughout the semester that they're engaged. Um, so this year we had 15,000 young leaders apply for the Millennium Fellowship from around the world um, and 1,400 campuses. Um, and despite the challenges that I know has brought on all of us, um, we just celebrated the resilient class of 2020 with um, 1,000 Millennium Fellows in 80 campuses across 20 countries around the world. Um, and if I could just spotlight three fellows that have stood out to us and have taken action over the past year, um, working on causes that they truly care about. Um, we have Kaiser Kabue from Kenyatta University in Kenya, who realized the urgency that the pandemic has brought on all of us and decided that as a young person, he needs to take action. He utilized his technical skills in artificial intelligence and in machine learning to develop an application that can provide early diagnosis of COVID-19 through measurement of vital signs. Um, Sadie Testaseca from Florida International University in the United States created an, a curriculum that uh, supports fifth grade students and teaches them about human rights. Um, and she's impacted 250 people in her local community through her work. Um, we also have fellows in India with Ganesh Dalip and five millennium fellows at IIT Madras who have joined forces together to create India's first university-based 
Study Center for the Climate Change to provide overarching frameworks for um, facilitating interdisciplinary research, collaboration, and funding for the field of climate action. These are just three of 754 Millennium Fellows and projects that are tackling all 17 SDGs locally on the campus this year. Um, the fellows are guided by three main values that they hear and preach through the work that they do, and that's empathy, similar to what my panelists have just shared, humility, and inclusion. Um, they take these guiding values through the work as they tackle complex issues from looking at the impact of the pandemic and what it has had on their communities to addressing issues on climate action to fighting racial inequalities. Um, together, um, we look at the impact that young people have made this year through our small community and it's they've dedicated over 206,000 hours and impacted the lives of over 2 million people this year. So you can read more about our work at millenniumfellows.org, but I, as I reflect on what our small community has been able to accomplish, I think about all of the potential that young people around the world have created um, and all of the potential that is still untapped. Um, there is so much more that we can do as organizations that work hand in hand with universities um, as we continue to invest in young people, invest in their power, invest in their passion and motivation to create change. Um, so I think as I wrap up, I just want to say, you know, it's really up to us to find more innovative ways of one collaboration, both as universities and nonprofits and across sectors um, to make sure that young people have the values and the competencies and resources to be global citizens and work on um, sustainable futures and achieving the SDGs. Um, it's been an honor joining you today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to engaging with the speakers at the Q&A session. Thank you, Noha. What wonderful examples. And it's really inspiring. And I think what you're doing is giving us examples of the theme that uh, you know, has been a kind of a recurrent theme in the panel, uh, which is the power of young people to actually achieve the goals and, and both through education, but also through solutions. Um, wonderful to hear. Um, let me turn now to Professor Stefano Zamagni um, to give us a closing statement for the, uh, for, the, for the session. And then what we will try and fit in if we can is um, the lightning round of the one sentence you want to leave the audience with, which I think is a, is a nice way to end, uh, end, end the day. Uh, Professor Zamagni, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sandri. I'm very happy to participate uh, to this uh, gathering. Uh, and uh, let me congratulate for the terrific uh, organization of this uh, youth uh, symposium. Now, let me start from this consideration. Education is a human right which makes it a moral responsibility as well as a societal responsibility. As Pope Francis uh, puts it, uh, it is a summons of to solidarity with the current and future generation. We all know the content of goal number four of SDG. And uh, we have to conclude that there is nothing more essential to the sustainable development agenda than access uh, to education for all, all over the world. Now, we have to admit that we need to update the education system, intervening both on its contents and on its organizational setup. As far as the content is concerned, it seems to me that the new education has to favor the development of the right skills and attitude, including above all critical thinking, creativity and imagination, which are in particular in this historical period, very important. Students in higher education must evolve to become lifelong learners. And this we know is technically feasible. Not only is education failing to encompass issues like climate change, social exclusion, new forms of slavery, of course, there are important exception, we have to admit, but we have to admit that this is uh, the general mood. It is also silent education when it comes to the ethical dimension. Time has come to recognize that the utilitarian ethical framework is not a proper guide for a new education profile. I would favor a move to virtue ethics along the neo-Aristotelian lines. Now, as far as uh, the 
organizational setup of educational system is concerned, we need to recognize the Tayloristic model of organization is not at all adequate. Taylorism this entered into factories, but then it moved into schools and the university, as we know from history. If we want to meet the challenges of a new education, it is not only a matter of moving from vertical to horizontal teaching methods. What is required is an organizational model capable of keeping together three basic elements, knowledge, skills, and character. Indeed, wanting to do the right thing is something different from knowing the right thing to do. And that, in turn, is something other than actually doing the right thing. The point is that knowing, in other words, thinking, does not necessarily result into doing. In other words, changing behavior. Now, how to put the concept into action? It seems to me that connection is the answer. The notion of connection appears already in the writings of Aristotle 2,400 years ago. But in the last couple of centuries, it has been abandoned in educational practices. Connection, conceived as the desire to learn, desire to learn, connects uh, connect cognitions and emotions to actions. That is why educators must foster the learner's connection. In other words, the desire to learn. Now, a final point, because my time is limited, as the same as a third book, refers uh, to the world uh, of uh, general companies, corporations. And that is an argument which is, in a sense, a symmetrical to the one developed by Fernando, who referred specifically to universities. Companies need uh, to embrace a sense of purpose beyond making only, only profits. They have to consider the well-being of all their stakeholders. Investors need to focus on the long term and to consider explicitly the social and environmental impact of their investments. Civil society organizations need to work together to address global changes through community organization practices. Now, today, enlightened business leaders are understanding that focusing on maximizing shareholder value has no future. The tendency is to move towards the so-called total societal impact, according to which companies as cognitive institutions are considering the impact of their activities on the social and environmental dimension, as well as on the economic one. An impractical implication of this uh, uh, approach is that uh, companies have to modify their approach. They should move from corporate training to corporate education. We cannot uh, accept that companies should not be interested in involved in education. Most companies limit internal and external learning to contents that provide knowledge and skills needed to perform specific tasks that allow employees to work with optimal effectiveness and efficiency in different areas of the corporate core competence. But although this is useful, and nobody would object to that, it seems to me that corporations should move towards uh, corporate ed education, which goes behind uh, corporate training by adding dimensions that deal with the doing the right things instead of only doing things right. The purpose, in other words, is to stimulate normative reflection to challenge intellectual reaction with regard to dilemmas occurring in the real world and to put the daily business activities in perspective to a greater purpose. Now, it seems to me to conclude that is very important because otherwise, unless we establish a bridge between schools and the university and the, the let's say, a company's world, it would be very difficult 
that we will be able to achieve the goals that we were talking about in this symposium, and in particular, obtaining the desired results of our effort. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Zamagni. And I think you really summarized wonderfully what uh, uh, some of the points that both were made, but also brought in the issue of the role and responsibility of corporations uh, for a more holistic uh, education. So thank you for that. We're at the end of our session. I'm going to turn to our panelists and ask you one sentence only. What would you like to leave the audience with? Um, Noha, why don't we start with you? Thank you. Um, I think one, one sentence I would just say as we approach the new year of 2021, I hope we can all um, just rethink how we can do good for our world and, and just renew the commitments to social impact and sustainable development. Excellent. Professor Jose, can we have your one sentence, please? Yes, Professor. Okay, I think there are some technical issues here. Uh, so let's move on while we sort that out. Uh, Professor Obigwe, can we have your one sentence? Y yes, uh, just to say that um, universities do not, they are not standalone. And in my country, for, for, country, for instance, uh, sustainability must address local concerns of impunity, good governance, justice, equity. Otherwise, the good work that universities are doing will be a mirage. We need to connect these dots. Universities must connect to business, to government. Thank you. Wonderful. Professor Rimas. Look, I think we, we have a big challenge. Uh, the path that we're on is not sustainable. We're burning the planet. You, you look at what we're doing in schools is not very effective. 30% of the students in PISA say their life has no meaning, has no purpose. Even when we try to teach about SDG, it doesn't work. I review here evidence on the effectiveness of climate change curriculum. And when you only teach students the science, the facts, it leaves them hopeless. It gives them they cannot, they cannot do anything about it. It's only when you combine as professor as Professor Zamani was saying, when you combine knowledge and deep understanding of the facts with hope that people actually become engaged. And hope comes from engaging in activities that show them that they can do something about it. Now, the question then is, how do we tackle this complex challenge, which is complex for the reasons Professor Zamani has explained well, and because of the scale, 1.3 billion people. We begin somewhere. Let me give you an example of how breaking a complex problem into simple steps can help. We have 28,000 universities in the world. Suppose only 10% decided today that we're gonna have one professor work with five students, as I did here, developing curriculum for schools. That would produce in one year, 14,000 specific curriculum resources to help schools teach about climate change which is more than the entire UN system has produced in its entire history to support teachers to do that. So I think the thing to do about this problem is stop contemplating it and just start leading by example. Do something because in the action is the path to hope, which is what we need to become engaged. Stop contemplating the problem because contemplation alone leads to paralysis. Thank you. Excellent. Professor Zamagni, any final words from you? I, I totally agree with Fernando. That is why I like the word connection. Connection means uh, knowledge joint to action. So far, we have kept the two elements uh, separated. But that was not at the beginning. Uh, that is why I mentioned Aristotle. We have to put uh, knowledge at the service of action. And action should presuppose that knowledge. And that is why we need a cooperative uh, strategy with the world of business. Because otherwise, our people, when they get out of the university, 
unless they found a place, a working place where, let's say, the CEO is already acquainted with these ideas, he or she will be frustrated. And I think that Fernando is right. Universities should uh, open these uh, bridges with uh, the world of companies and in more general um, institutions. Excellent. Thank Let you. Let me try again if uh, Professor Jose can uh, hear us and if we can hear him. Uh, would you have a final thought to leave with the audience? Pasado cinco, perdón, el pasado 5 de junio, el Papa Francisco celebró una nueva universidad que no da títulos ni carreras, que no enseña cosas, sino la propia vida. Se llama la Universidad del Sentido. Recuperemos el sentido en nuestras universidades y en el sistema educativo, y si recuperamos el sentido, la sociedad va a ser no solamente más justa, sino que la paz va a ser posible. Muchas gracias. Excellent. And let's give the final word to our youth representative, Teresa. What do you want to leave the audience with? My one sentence would be, I implore you to think about what your role is in leaving no one behind. That is the high level panelist about what are we doing about data and accessibility? And for your university students, what am I doing for marginalized students, communities around my campus that do not have the privilege that I have? Thank you very much. What a wonderful note to end on. So thank you very much. I know we have breakout uh, sessions that are gonna happen now. So um, I wanna conclude by saying that I think the, there are a few themes that really stood out in today's session. The first was uh, the need to use and to in create an environment where university students are actually doing much more than just learning, uh, but they're actually going out and teaching and solving and actually implementing uh, the, the, the solutions that they need to so that we actually make a difference at scale. And I think the scale question was the other big theme that came out that there's so much to do, there's so little time, um, and we have actually not been successful over the last several decades in, in addressing some of these issues that we believe are so important. And finally, the need to make sure that education as we see it is focused on values that teachers teach, that they, are, that, they, that they integrate and practice what they are trying to teach and that they have the support that they need. And finally, as Teresa reminded us, each one of us needs to do something today. On that note, thank you so much for joining and Sam, I hand it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chandrika, and thank you to our wonderful speakers. It's been such uh, an exciting uh, couple of sessions. And thank you to our audience for sticking around. And of course, to our wonderful moderators, Chandrika, Monica, and at, at the beginning, Jeff. Uh, given so much content has been covered and there is so much to talk about, we will have some breakout sessions. So feel free to stick around for another uh, 15, 20 minutes and you will go into different groups and, and you know, reflect on the session. But before that happens, I would want to just speak one minute about the, the reflections on the entire day. We talked about the importance of changing policy and working with governments, the importance of localization in education, working organically with local institutions, developing inclusive and uh, whole school curriculum, the importance of a comprehensive approach to education, looking at socio-emotional, multicultural, interdisciplinary, and of course, uh, a localized angle. Uh, the importance of bringing young people to the table for this transformation and working with them as partners. The importance of universities in mobilizing the knowledge, expertise, and human resources to support Target 4.7 and uh, transformations needed to tackle climate change. The importance of digital technologies to transform learning, but also understanding their limitations, um, as um, Professor Schiesler uh, pointed out earlier. And the importance of not just curriculum, but how it is applied and how empowered uh, we can make and support teachers. Uh, in, in other words, uh, professional education as well, and going beyond the SDGs. So. Wonderful. It ends there. And tomorrow we have a very exciting and action packed day ahead of us. Join me tomorrow where we will have the executive director of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, 
uh, uh, Muhammad Yunus, the Nobel laureate and founder of the Grameen Bank, Hindu Ibrahim, the uh, indigenous rights activist and representative of the uh, Secretary General, um, uh, SDG advocates, uh, Professor Yanis Varoufakis, one of the key architects of the Green Deal uh, in Europe, uh, and of course the Secretary General's envoy on youth. Finally, we will have the wonderful uh, uh, launch of the fourth edition of the Youth Solutions Report. So we will start here again at 7.55 New York time tomorrow, Thursday, with the Executive Director of UNICEF, who, will, who I will ask about their role and their uh, instrumental position in saving lives during this pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us. Live stream can stop there. And we will now go into 